morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 380 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. A little extended version for you today. Ah, today, recording date is Monday, May 13th, 2024. And it looks like it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Mr. Grizzly on the go today. More about that later. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries, eh, from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have, uh, we have our usual Monday morning uh, extended show for you. But before we do anything else, let's ask our dear friend, Mr. Grizzly, how is your mental health doing today, sir? My mental health today, uh, pretty good, I think. Uh, physical health, I'm feeling a little off this morning. Um, you might be able to hear it a little bit in my throat, my th- a little scratchy. I don't know. I don't know if I hope I definitely it's just- do. I hope it's just allergies and and not a cold. I think it's just allergies, to be honest with you. Uh, I had to take a lot of Benadryl over the weekend on top of the daily medication I take for allergies. So, yeah, I think it's just an allergy situation. Uh, I do believe the pollen count is sky high right now. And so that that, that might very much have something to do with it. I'm just going to check it right here to see. To be doubly, doubly sure. Yes, it's very high today. (laughs) Yeah, very high. Air quality is low risk. Mold is moderate. But, uh, yeah, very high today. That's that explains it. It's been like that all weekend, so I'll probably be suffering for the next couple of days, sounding like I have a bit of a head cold, head and chest cold. When no, it's just allergies, just allergies. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, I hope that clears up because I, I can't relate. Fortunately, I have no environmental allergies. I have food Very bugs. Uh, but once uh, I was down in Tampa for some reason and as soon as we got to town like five minutes after we were into town it was like congested from here to here mm-hmm. like this for like four straight days and as soon and then 10 minutes after we left town i was good so something in town no you're idea. allergic to yeah. yeah i have no idea what it was but i did not like it yeah. at all at all um also kids and cubs because we didn't do it before the weekend uh it was Mother's Day on the weekend. So uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone. Belated, of course, because we didn't have a show yesterday. Uh, for me personally, it's been about 20 years since my beaver mama was uh, no longer of this world. So, um, you know, marking the occasion is a little different for me. Yes. Um, I know you all think you had the best mama ever, but I did. So, Shh. <laughs> that contest is over. Uh, no, seriously, uh, I, I do miss her terribly. Um, but I have been blessed, fortunately, with the, so many beautiful mother figures in my life. Their love, their wisdom, and their encouragement have all played vital roles in making me the beaver that I am today. Mm-hmm. So um, whether you're a mom or an aunt 
or a friend, a sister, a niece, a grandma, a transgender mom, a foster mom, a legal guardian, a father who is both mother and father, a teacher, a coach, even a caring neighbor Mm -hmm. who has been motherly to someone who needed it. Thank you. Yes. For everything. And on, 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 and on that note, I have to be in the office in just a few minutes. Uh, oh, we have a I was, special, special meeting today. Sorry, I, like I'm, I'm okay. I get out of here like right yes. now. I was going to ask how things went with, with Momo Grizzly, but. Oh, we had a great we'll day together last night, so it was really good. But I do have to run into the office. So we, we had debated on recording a show last night, but both of us were pretty exhausted and just, I, I wasn't feeling it. So when you said, can we just do it tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, I'm happy to do it tomorrow. So I have to run into the office and I will pick up with you lovely folks uh, shortly. Uh, for the time being, I will be uh, tied up. But Mr. Grizzly will, Mr. Grizzly, I'm Mr. Grizzly, Mr. Beaver. First cup of coffee. Sounds like being tied up is fun. He's already forgotten who I am. Mr. Beaver will be, <laughs> uh, holding, holding down the fort while I am uh, indisposed work-related uh, issues. So I will uh, see you all very, very shortly. So enjoy yourselves, and uh, I'll be back in about 30, 40 minutes. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I'll see you when I get back. Bon voyage. Thanks. He's so cute when he blushes. <laughs> ah, sorry, I have an itchy nose. Uh, there we go. Uh, Kit Lefty Lance, they did a great job. You're a fine little beaver. Well, thank you so much, sir. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, let's say good morning to the kids as well, uh, because there are a lot of you here this morning. So good morning to you, Kit Elaine, Kit Vim, Kit Toronto Dan, who is a very cosmopolitan and international, saying bonjour, shalom, ni hao, buongiorno, and what guan to all of us. Uh, there you go. A little sabor to the show. Never hurts at all, right? Uh, Kit Michael has... Uh, Good news, of course, says what a glorious weekend. Just got back from my youngest daughter's university commencement in North Carolina. My heart is full. Sorry to brag. Not sorry. Do not be sorry. Brag all you want. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. I'm so happy for you. That must have been a very, very proud moment, my friend. Good morning, Kit Mohan. Good morning. Let's see, Kit Cassie. I hope everything's going well in Manitoba. Lovely to see you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Uh, did I say Kit Vim? If I didn't, I'm sorry, but uh, good morning, Kit Vim. Uh, let's see who else do we have today with us. Mm, just going through Kit Linda. Good morning, dear. Lovely to see you, Kit Tavi G. Still looking through the magic mirror here. Who else do we have here at our romp room? Ah, Kit Super Kyle. Hello, my friend. Lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us this morning, Kit Carol. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. Us, Kit Saucy is here with us. Kit Argosi Acres is with us. Good morning to you both. Kit Mr. Cal, Kit Jen. Lovely to see you as well. Ah, Miss Shadika. Good morning to you and to all the family. We already said hello to Mohan earlier. And let's see. I'm sure there are more of you here on the chat. Mateo said, oh, Miss Shadika says, I'm the best mom ever now. Mateo just said so. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I guess it's been said I have been vetoed by Mateo. That's okay. I'm good with that. <laughs> and Kit Donna, good morning to you, my dear. Kit Donna's the last one to get in before we start with the show. All right. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I uh, had a wonderful weekend, and I hope you did too. In the news, uh, I'm going to have to change the order a little bit because I thought I might have a couple of minutes with Mr. Grizzly here before he had to go because a couple of the things that uh, I have have video clips. And, uh, of course, uh, I need to, my dear friend and producer to be able to take care of that part. So we'll skip over that part, and uh, we'll start today uh, with wildfire news. Uh, when we started the show... Uh, the eager beaver, you will remember that if you've been with us from uh, the beginning, the earlier days, uh, we started during the midst of the COVID pandemic. And basically we started every show with the national uh, coast to coast to coast COVID roundup. And it seems that probably for the next few months, we'll probably be starting most 
shows with the wildfire roundup because the season has started and if anything this year is going to be anything like last year and it seems it is because we are in an El Nino year and according to all the meteor meteorolo- ah, let's try that again meteorological experts um, the second year of an uh, El Nino phase or La Nina phase is the worst one in terms of temperatures and intensity and all that kind of stuff so um slated for this year will be a repeat of uh, what we experienced last year. Uh, To that effect, uh, one of the most affected regions in Canada at the current moment is northeastern British Columbia. Officials in Fort Nelson say that the Parker Lake fire, and that's the one that's what they're calling it, uh, grew in size uh, overnight between Uh, not last night, but the night before. And at that time was less than four kilometers from the town. That was as of uh, 5 p.m. yesterday. And burning on all three sides of it as of uh, 9 p.m., guessing that the fourth side is the lake here. Telecom services to British Columbia, Yukon, and Northwest Territories were knocked out for a while. Some of them had been restored, including the 911 service, but repairs were still ongoing as the fire worsened, so don't know how long that uh, lasted or if it uh, still is the case. Uh, They are relying on backup systems and broadcasters to get information out. Once again, Kits and Cubs, if you happen to know people who are in that area, who might have to evacuate at some point or are currently in evacuation mode and uh, they need to maintain access to the latest information but maybe don't have a lot of battery or bandwidth. If you are talking to them, please recommend to them www.cbc.ca slash light, L-I-T-E. That's a low bandwidth service that CBC, our national broadcaster, the one that uh, PP wants to cut. Hmm? but that serves us very well in states of emergency like this. It's a low bandwidth site where uh, the articles that they have on CBC are all published, but without photos and graphics and video and that type of stuff. So it allows people to uh, manage uh, their cell phone data or battery when uh, they still need to keep their phone open for, to keep, uh, keep updated to information, um, but don't have access uh, to the ability to recharge their phone quite now. So please uh, remember that. Again, www.cbc.ca slash light, L-I-T-E. Currently, now, there are three actual big blazes burning out of control near the community of Fort Nelson and the Fort Nelson First Nation. Fire is encroaching on the small town from all three sides, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Reporters on the ground describe the air as being acrid and uh, with smoke and uh, so much so that your eyes burn and uh, that the basically the sky is gray right down to the ground. Thousands have been evacuated to Fort St. John, which is about five hours to the south, four to five hours to the south. About 3,400 people have already left. Uh, evacuees are now being directed to Prince George because Fort St. John is pretty much full up. Uh, the mayor of the area, Rob Fraser, says that he's really proud of everyone. Quote, we moved 3,500 people in six hours with no notice. And the mayor has been on his feet for days there. So uh, he's doing a, a lot of good work trying to make sure that everybody leaves. Uh, Northeastern British Columbia officials are trying to get any remaining residents out uh, because the fire has grown significantly. Cliff Chapman was with the BC Bot Wildfire Service, and he says, if you, are still in Fort, if you are still in Fort Nelson or anywhere in the evacuation area or evacuation order of the Parker Lake wildfire, I encourage you to leave. The fuels are as dry as we have ever seen, he says. The wind is going to be sustained, and it's going to push the fire towards the community. Escape routes may be compromised, and visibility will be poor as the fire continues to grow. Ben Bulgen is a fire behavior specialist with BC Wildfire Service, and he says, The next 48 hours will be challenging, giving forecasted westerly winds and extreme dry and volatile fuels in the area. Mayor uh, Mayor Fraser is really concerned about the approximate 37 households 
who by around yesterday afternoon had stated that they are not leaving. That may have changed as the fire encroaches. Um, he said yesterday that tonight is the last stand. Uh, the fire, unfortunately, was not helped because on Saturday, water bombers were not able to, t- to take off from Fort St. John to help. Uh, emergency operations had to relocate at some point during the weekend because the fire was closing in and the RCMP have closed off the main highway into town. People are seriously, seriously concerned that there will not be a town to return to in this case because, uh, sadly, the weather forecast has winds picking up over the next uh, while, 48 hours, picking up and expected to blow up speeds up to 40 kilometers an hour and, of course, well, wind helps spread fire. It's uh, also uh, fuel in this case. Um, There's also major situations across the prairie provinces uh, with flames nearing several population centers. As of about nine o'clock yesterday, about 600 people were evacuated in northern Manitoba, part of the highway in the Cranberry Portage region near the Saskatchewan border, uh, which is near Flin Flon, has been closed. The fire is deemed to be out of control and in such a remote area that firefighters needed to be flown in in order to be able to help fight it. The fire is about 35,000 hectares, and a hectare is 10,000 square kilometers. So 35,000, sorry, 35 million square kilometers. Just one fire. It's about twice the size of the city of Regina, and it's burning as of yesterday. This is at 9 p.m., about one kilometer from the community. Uh, reporters there describe uh, the scene as being dark skies with ash falling from it. In a Grand Prairie County area, 17 homes were evacuated. So far, no structures or properties are damaged yet. And uh, if you're in uh, Fort McMurray, uh, you're probably having all the feels, especially if you were there in 2016. But an evacuation alert has sent uh, has about th- has thousands of people on edge over there. Uh, there they have a 4,000 hectare fire uh, that, uh, as of yesterday afternoon, was burning about 16 kilometers away from, uh, from the city. Fire officials say that uh, so far, so far in 2024, and we're just uh, May 13th, 24,000 acres or 9,700 hectares have burned so far. That's 97 million square kilometers of forest have burned so far. I, Mother Nature. It was Mother's Day on the weekend. Mother Nature. We have not been doing right by her. And uh, she is letting us know. We need to get our act together. But uh, our thoughts uh, and uh, feelings of comfort are uh, with everyone uh, over there. Please, 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 please please do listen to the directions you are getting from officials. Do not be a hero. Do not try to stay. Uh, If uh, sometimes these evacuations happen fast and uh, you might decide you want to stay and things get bad and they don't have time to come around a second time. So uh, please. If uh, someone uh, comes and knocks on your door and says, or you hear messages on the radio and whatnot and says you need to clear out, please do it as fast as you can and in as, as orderly fashion as you can to help out our first responders. Make sure that you don't put any other anybody else at risk um, by having to have them come back to try and do a second check. All right. Uh, Kit Cassie says, a prairie grass fire scares the poop out of me. Uh, I've never seen one. I don't know uh uh, what those look like uh, at all, but I'm sure that uh, that must have spread rather quickly, I would assume. Exactly. Kit Donago's houses can be rebuilt. Kit Moan, it's only stuff. It can mostly be replaced. Yes, I know that there are memories and whatnot, and in the moment you try to, you know, it's, it's a panic decision. And, but uh, life first. Get out in one piece. Right? That's the thing that matters. Uh And yeah, Kit Jen, Mama is pissed. Yeah, she is. Uh, 
back on the other side of the world, um, about 300,000 people have left uh, the city of Rafa. There's about 1.4 million people there at the moment because that was the place to which everybody escaped as uh, uh, northern Gaza was uh, being bombed by the Netanyahu government and the, the military there. Um, people are wondering where there is to go because there really is nowhere else to go, but uh, they are uh, basically doing it, uh, entering into Rafa. They're not doing the full ground invasion that the U.S. warned them about. Um, but it seems that uh, the Netanyahu, Netanyahu government got a little clever or uh, too cute by half. By uh, They're essentially not so much, um, how would you put it? not executing their plan, but breaking down their plan into like eight, nine, ten smaller components and executing smaller ones. So I'm guessing the plan is to rather than just go in all at once and do it, which would raise the ire of the United States is to, okay, fine, you know, it'll just make it take longer then. But uh, yes, we'll break down the entire campaign into these X number of little operations and we'll do them one by one. So that's the general sense of what it is that is happening uh, there at the moment. So when they're saying they go into the, the, the Israeli forces are into Rafa, but, oh, wait a minute, they said, you know, don't go into Rafa. Well, that's how they're doing it. It seems to be the, the definition of what going into Rafa means is a, a little bit flexible. Uh, but Israel is pushing deeper into the area with tanks and troops. Uh, on Fortunately for uh, the government of Israel, some Israeli troops uh, have had to be, in, be redeployed to northern Gaza because Hamas has allegedly returned, reorganized, and is striking back in that area. Quote, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken on uh, TV interviews uh, yesterday, because it's political Sunday, so all the major shows were on, said, quote, they may go in and have some initial success, but potentially at, potentially at an incredibly high cost. Uh, Blinken says that Israel has failed to develop credible plans for safeguarding civilians and for stabilizing Gaza after the war ends. The credible plan for safeguarding civilians is one of the conditions, the red lines for the United States because um, it has threatened and it has actually stopped some shipments of offensive weapons already to Israel. Um, Blinken went on to say, if they leave and get out of Gaza, as we believe what they need to do, then you're going to have a vacuum, and a vacuum that's likely to be filled by chaos, by anarchy, and ultimately by Hamas again. And uh, hence goes the never-ending circle. The United Nations is warning that there are extreme shortages of food, fuel, and other essentials, according to uh, NPR News. Uh, we mentioned uh, a couple of days that uh, Cindy McCain, who works with the UN Food World Program, had already confirmed that we were in a situation of famine. Not that it was coming, not that it would be there soon, but it was actually already happening full blown famine in the north and that it could spread very quickly to the south. And with famine, uh, it's really important to try to not get it to set in because once it does, it's very hard to reverse. Um, but uh, there was a period of about five days after Israel had seized the border uh, in uh, northern uh the northern Gaza border, that uh, nothing was coming in for pretty much five days uh, during a time where they were already warning that famine was already here. Uh, Georges Petropoulos, the head of OCHA, which is the UN's humanitarian agency in Gaza, says that two of its key agencies, the World Food Program, which we just discussed, and UNRWA, which was uh, the United uh, Nation for uh, uh, Palestinian Works and Relief, I believe it is, uh, that both will run out of food for distribution today. There were already severe shortages of food and other humanitarian essentials in Gaza, but these have been exacerbated because of problems at border checkpoints. As we mentioned before, last week Israeli troops closed Rafah, which was the main aid conduit, and only a trickle of supplies were getting through through the Karam Shalom crossing. The situation could worsen if Israel launches a major offensive against Hamas militants in Rafah. 
uh, something that the White House has warned against until Israel has a plan to safeguard civilians in the area. And it seems that uh, there might have been another crossing somewhere that's been uh, opened up for a little bit of a humanitarian aid. According to health authorities in Gaza, if they are to be believed, the death toll over there has surpassed 35,000. And the only reason for which I say if they are to be believed in this case is because of the well-known saying that in war, the first casualty is the truth. So it might be overreported, and just like, you know, they might not have, have, have the resource to do the full count, and this might be an underreport. We don't know. Um, Today, uh, the 13th, is Memorial Day for fallen soldiers and victims of terrorism in Israel. Um, police clashed with some of the families of the hostages, however, over the weekend, uh, and uh, actually fired water cannons at them. Uh, they have been holding daily, near-daily demonstrations calling out to their government because they have not been doing a good job, according to them, to bring the hostages home. There are still over 100 hostages that have not been returned and uh, not been able to be confirmed, but the, to the best numbers, there's about 36 or 37 of them that may have died while in captivity and will not be returning. Um, Memorial Day is uh, interesting because it happens the day before Independence Day, so uh, around sundown uh, Israel time on the 13th. Um, there's sort of a transition, and this is a, a, intentional to sort of, you know, think about the people that have sacrificed and the people that were lost uh, leading into celebrations of Independence Day, um, which is um, May 14th. As we mentioned on the show earlier, uh, there was supposed to be an event in Ottawa, but uh, the mayor canceled it, uh, replacing it simply with a, fry, uh, a flag raising, uh, which... Uh, irritated many members of uh, the Jewish community in Ottawa and even MP Anthony Ahav's father because they made uh, the claim that if people are threatening other Canadian citizens' ability to gather to mark an occasion, the solution is not to cancel the occasion, but to do what needs to be done to make sure that the event is safe so that they can participate. Um, I can argue a for and against on either of those, depending on the size of the threat. It might be better to cancel. I mean, we've seen that on the campaign trail. Even the prime minister has canceled some stops every now and then. Uh, when the security has determined that uh, that needs to be done. So uh, sometimes you do need to cancel, uh, unfortunately. Um, the question is, of course, is how much work an effort were they willing to put in to be able to hold the event anyway with extra security and that of course we'll probably never know um, efforts by the federal government here in canada via a special measures uh, which are similar to special measures that we had for example when the war broke out in ukraine um, so efforts by the federal government via those types of measures for Palestinians with extended family in Canada to help them escape the war. Uh, so far, those have failed. As it seems that the main reason for which it has failed is not because of lack of effort from the Canadian government, but because Israel and Egypt are obligated to approve the names submitted uh, to Ottawa. Uh, and, uh, well... Basically, um, they've approved none. A grand total of zero have been approved to leave by Israel and Egypt, not by Canada. Uh, that has left some no choice but to pay smugglers thousands of dollars to get their relatives to Egypt. Because if you can get to Cairo, then maybe, maybe you'll have a chance. Mike Morris of the Green Party of Canada wants the federal government to press Israel and Egypt to start accepting some of these applications. Quote, we have heard from Minister Miller and Minister Jolie. We have seen photos with their counterparts, so we know that those lines of communication are open. It's basically saying, uh, well, you know, I know you're out there. I hear you breathing. I see you meeting with them. Apply some pressure. LFG. Right. 
So that's basically what uh, the Green Party's position here is. Uh, while Immigration Canada is discouraging people from getting to Egypt by unofficial means, it has, however, approved travel for 179 people who have managed to get there. Uh, and uh, with regard to the college campus uh, activities in the United States, more than 2,800 people have been arrested in the United States so far. And uh, in Canada, I believe we mentioned on Friday that uh, there was uh, action taken uh, in Alberta to dismantle one of these encampments, um, and uh, which is causing some questions about uh, how they got to that decision and uh, who approved that and all that kind of stuff. And uh, as we mentioned on Friday, it's creating an interesting compare and contrast moment between uh, how the situation is being ha handled on that campus in Alberta and as how it's being ha handled on other campuses in Canada. And it's uh, causing people to ask the question, what is it about the uh, government in Alberta that seems to be so relatively trigger happy to be able uh, to want to dismantle a protest or an encampment of this type. And of course, we're having another compare and contrast move uh, moment uh, when we compare and contrast how fast an encampment of mostly students, not all students, however, not all students, but uh, mostly students, uh, when they are protesting for our government to do something and for the Netanyahu government to stop bombing the way it is indiscriminately in Palestine, uh, how that gets dismantled in just a couple of days, but Kutz got to go on and on and on and on. And uh, as we found out through the Public Order Emergency Commission and then the, the court case at uh, uh, the federal court, um, Alberta didn't choose themselves to uh, try to recruit the tow trucks that were necessary or any of that activity to try and dismantle coots. They wanted the federal government to send in military equipment, of course, because that would have created a great visual scene, military equipment uh, being used against citizens. Uh, but of course, that's what that side wants, is that uh, violent imagery that they can then uh, spit and torque and do the propaganda with. Um, but it seems that, uh, yes, the government of Alberta wasn't particularly inclined to use its own abilities and resources to dismantle it. So they were quite fine with uh, the protest, so long as it was all white. If it was all white, it was all right. So, yeah, uh, all the, the UCP government has some interesting uh, ethical questions to be answering at the moment why it is that coot gets to go on for that amount of time and the government will not use all its resource to try and dismantle it versus this protest and why this protest in calgary gets dismantled in this way whereas uh, the encampments in other cities are allowed to continue so long as they are peaceful um yeah Danielle Smith is, um, how would I say, not particularly an ally of democracy, it would seem in this case. So, yeah, there are going to be some questions, uh, especially uh, if we've seen some uh, video, the police just kind of swooped in and just looked sort of like, you know, just tore everything apart. And as we mentioned, they came in with riot gear and they had flashbangs and uh, gas and uh, that type of stuff. So, mm, I don't know. More to come, kids. Now, little changing moods. 
to a little sports ball. Yeah. <laughs> if you're watching the Stanley Cup playoffs uh, last night, we had another match with the Vancouver Canucks defeating the Edmonton Oilers 4-3 to to take a 2-1 series lead. Um, so far, uh, it's been a pretty darn good series. I mean, just very exciting hockey, um, high-scoring games. Um, so, I mean, what's not to love here? Uh, just, uh, and, you know, both teams are from Canada, so no matter who wins, everybody wins. I'm kind of pulling a little bit for the Oilers, though. Uh, it seems that there are more Canadian-born players on the team. Hey, you have to pick a reason to pick one over the other, right? <laughs> and also, very, very positive news, Kits and Cubs, because um, once again, uh, another weekend, another world championship for team canada yes my friends my kids and cubs this weekend was the world para ice hockey championships or uh, basically uh, as we we call it in canada often sledge hockey the it was canada versus the united states as one would expect uh at this level uh the united states was going for its fourth straight gold against canada so three-time champions the United States were. Well, with uh, two periods over, Canada was up 2-0. Uh, our good friend Devin Haru brought it to my attention that this was going on, so I uh, tuned in to watch the last period. It was exciting. Uh, Team Canada uh, decided to switch uh, into defense mode and uh, basically tried to um, uh, prevent the United States from scoring two or three goals in the last period. Uh, so most of the play was actually happening in Team Canada zone, which uh, was not the case for most of the match up until then, it seems. Uh, but Team Canada defended well. Uh, Team United States' is, um, number one scorer did uh, give Team Canada a little pause for concern by scoring with uh, fewer than four minutes left. Uh, but Team Canada was able to uh, maintain the shutdown uh, strategy and take the gold on home ice. So it's uh, the first world championship win since 2017 for Team Canada for our sledge hockey team at the world championship. Uh, Dominic Cozzolino and Anton Jacobs Webb scored for Team Canada and goaltender and uh, Adam Kingsmill stopped 24 of 25 shots. Uh, was very, 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 very good at uh, getting in there and smothering the puck when it was needed. Declan Farmer uh, from the United States, he was the person uh, I was talking to you about uh, managed to score that goal. Um, yeah, and he's apparently like one of the, the better players on the international scene. Um, so this was the seventh time that Canada and the United States clashed for a gold medal in the final. Um, the Americans beat Canada in 2018 and 22 Paralympic Games finals as well, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll probably fix that in uh, 2026. So uh, congratulations. Congratulations. That was uh, Canada's uh, fourth gold medal uh, in the history of the tournament that has been taking place since uh, 2008. And uh, the very, very first World Para Hockey Championships were held in uh, uh, were held in Canada for the first time in Moose Jaw uh, in 2023. So there you go. So this was only the second time, uh, I guess, that we've, uh, we've hosted it as well. So congratulations, uh, Team Canada. Very well done. And if you are a hockey fan uh, as well, the PWHL, the Women's Hockey League uh, playoffs are underway. And uh, there was an absolutely spectacular match over the weekend, uh, creating some history for the league. Uh, I mean, everything is history, but this is really history because uh, they had triple overtime, my friend. Uh, Boston versus Montreal and uh, Boston, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> won the match. 
uh, to take a 2-0 lead in the playoff uh, series over there. But you imagine triple overtime? That must have been fun. I am so sorry I missed it. Uh, the match finished uh, by the score of 2-1. to one. Uh, I would have really, really, really loved to have seen that one. Um, also, on the uh, international sports scene, uh, in beach volleyball, a Canadian duo uh, made it to the finals. Unfortunately, did not win the final, uh, but did make it. So they, they gave a really good fight, though, uh, to the final of uh, the BPT Futures event in Tingtan, China. Uh, they made it to the final. Uh, the two players for Canada are Jake McNeil and, I'm sorry, I have to uh, open each person's file uh, in Google to be able to get uh, data, get some cups. Jake McNeil and uh, last name Russell, Alexander William Russell. And uh, they uh, lost to a team from Brazil in three sets, 21-12, 13-21, and 15-11. So it was a very, very, very close uh, match. But it's uh, nice to see uh, a Canadian men's duo do so well because uh, our women's teams are fairly strong in beach volleyball. Our men's teams are a little weaker. Uh, but earlier, in, early in the days of beach volleyball, when, uh, uh, when it just uh, entered the Olympics, uh, the men and the women were strong. I believe the men had uh, taken the bronze at the Olympics in uh, the inaugural beach volleyball tournament. So uh, it's nice to see the Canadian men uh, back uh, on the global stage getting some uh, good results there. So there you go, kids. Uh, that's what I have from the world of sports ball. Hello, Mr. Grizzly. Good day. How's it going? Nice to see you. It's going very well. Uh, <clears throat> Somebody stole you... my adapter, so I can't plug my mic in. I have to use my oh. headset. Mic. Yeah, I don't know where it went. Somebody walked off with it. That happens sometimes. You know, I'm trying to find my adapter to plug. I have an external mic here at the office that I use for meetings, and uh, I went to plug it in, and nope, it's it's not a billable bit. Yeah, you know, somebody took my adapter, so I can't do anything, which is you know a little distressing, but it is what it is. Well, you are coming in clear, so we will take well, the that's win. That's good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Get Toronto Dan. Thank God Paul is wearing pants. <laughs> yes, because from that camera angle, we share a lot. All right. So um, this is what I was going to open up with, uh, but we're going to do it now. We have I'm some... not, I'm, all I'm getting, I'm not, that link isn't working for me. That link isn't working for you. No, it just gives me a, a search term for trending stuff. That's it. Okay, let's try. <clears throat> oh, yes. Yes. I don't know how that happened. That shouldn't have happened. Try that instead. There we go. Um, so. There we go. You that. know how we mentioned often that uh, the Conservative Party of Canada, or just basically the Conservative movement in general, is not able to organize a clean race? whether mm -hmm. it's uh, leadership or party dominations. And uh, we also mentioned uh, with regard to the public inquiry on foreign interference, how um, we should probably be looking at the way party nominations go down and maybe federal parties should just come to an agreement that they will let uh, the provincial or the federal electoral body monitor these types of things just to make sure that things are on the up and up because uh, they haven't been well um a while ago the conservative party of canada made big big hay for having recruited both jamel giovanni who did find his way into the house of commons and sabrina maddow maddow who was a journalist for uh, the National Post. And we came down a little hard on her because uh, basically as a conservative, her running as a conservative, we found it really interesting that she would be working for the National Post, which pretty much only exists still because of federal government subsidies, because uh, as we mentioned also previously on the show, uh, they're terrible with money. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't manage their finances very, very well. They are in the toilet. 
pretty much. Everybody's saying, like, they've been saying for a while now, like, they're just on the verge of bankruptcy, and then they keep on getting another bit of subsidy, and it's like, just let it die. So, she, uh, because of the federal government's largesse with media, she was able to have a career in the first place in order to build enough profile in order to be considered maybe a star candidate in a nomination. But uh, she was ungrateful. So she decided that uh, she was going to uh, take all of that free stuff that she accuses everybody else of getting and parlay that into a MP job for herself where she would uh, just move to fully living off the public teat instead of partially well uh and then the conservatives uh made big big deals about hey look at us we're fresh we're cool we're modernizing we're hip hey young people look at this we've got a woman and a guy who's at least part black yeah and we've got a guy who's part black who's not woke hey How's about that? Don't come and tell us we have no diversity. It's like, here's a tip. If the skin colors are different, but you all think the exact same thing, the diversity is only in skin color, not in actually thought or ideas. Indeed. So say it. Um, so it seems that uh, on May 9th, she posted a video announcing that she is suspending her campaign to be the next federal conservative candidate and MP for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. With, quote, sadly, I no longer have faith in the election's integrity. <gasps> Surprised, no, but shocked. not shocked? Yeah. Mr. Grizzly, please, roll the tape. One second, sir. Oh, Kit Saucy, bad time for a two for a joke. <laughs> you can sit next to me. <laughs> Today, I'm suspending my campaign to become the next federal conservative candidate and MP for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Living up to my values, why I entered this race to begin with, and my record of standing up for what's right leaves me no other choice. It comes down to this. I no longer have faith in the integrity of this election. Despite raising concerns to the Conservative Party nearly two weeks ago, despite submitting clear evidence of a corrupted process and potential legal actions taken by another campaign, nothing has been done. We asked again and again for action, but there's been no sign that a promised internal investigation is actually underway. No next step shared as we get closer and closer to a vote. Despite repeated requests, there's been zero communication to candidates or the riding's conservative voters to make them aware of interference with the democratic process. Zero communication that my campaign has been the clear target of highly unethical and potentially illegal efforts to sway the vote. There's been zero meaningful reassurances to me, other candidates or voters that this will still be an open and fair election. My campaign hasn't been the only one to complain. Others have as well. But I'll leave it to those candidates to decide if and when they'd like to make their concerns public. When voters reach out to say they feel harassed or that they don't feel secure voting and those concerns continue to go unaddressed, anyone who's truly committed to freedom and electoral integrity has no choice but to act. As a result, I can't in good conscience continue to be a part of this process. This isn't something I ever expected to say, and it's frankly heartbreaking after 110 days of campaigning and making so many sacrifices to be part of a conservative movement I believe in deeply, one that values freedom, the rule of law, and a strong democracy. I never asked to be acclaimed, I never asked for preferential treatment, and I never thought this would be easy or that there wouldn't be bumps or attacks along the way. All I ever asked and got assurances of was that this would indeed be an open and fair nomination contest. This, right now, isn't that. I'd like to thank my dedicated team, as well as supporters, donors, and volunteers who believed in my mission and gave so much of themselves to it. 
I also couldn't in good conscience continue to ask you to contribute to a corrupted contest. The voters of Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill deserve to democratically choose their next conservative candidate and MP. They deserve to know when there's been a breach of trust. They deserve to feel safe voting. I hope they still get the chance to. I call on the Conservative Party of Canada to secure our democratic nomination process, protect our values, and stand up to corrupt campaigns that show disdain for both. All right. Uh, now, under that tweet, if you, you want to put the tweet up uh, in the chat for the kids, uh, she goes on to describe uh, things here. Um, some of this might be a little repetitive. Uh, she says, despite raising concerns to the Conservative Party nearly two weeks ago, despite submitting clear evidence of a corrupted process and potential illegal actions taken by another campaign, nothing has been done. There has been no evidence that a promised internal investigation is actually underway, no next steps shared. Despite repeated requests, there has been zero communication to candidates or the writings conservative voters to make them aware of interference with the democratic process. Zero communication that my campaign has been the clear target of highly unethical and potentially illegal efforts to sway the vote. Zero meaningful reassurance to me, other candidates or voters that this will still be an open and fair election. And this is very interesting because in the foreign interference election, uh, for, sorry, for, for an interference commission, uh, yes, I know, I know. Election, it's, yeah. I know. I know, yes, really, I know. It's It was kind of a Freudian slip, um, kind of. Uh, the main conservative complaint has been, oh my God, Justin Trudeau so terrible, he didn't tell us that all these things were being happening, were going on, and then somebody complains to them that there are things going on in this one, and then they do nothing. Yeah, yeah. typical, right? Be the change you want to see. <clears throat> A bit here. As a result, I can't in good conscience continue to be a part of this process. This isn't something I ever expected to say, and it's frankly heartbreaking. After 110 days of campaigning, making sacrifices to be part of a conservative movement, I believe in deeply, one that values freedom, the rule of law, and a strong democracy. Uh, quote, the Conservative Party's rules for nominations are clear. Quote, a copy of the list of current members will not be provided prior to the closing notice. No candidate will receive an official list before the party greenlights them. This is because having an updated membership list is a huge advantage. It allows a campaign to target local members who are the only ones who can vote in a nomination with 100% efficiency. If one campaign has the list and others don't, the nomination is effectively rigged in their favor. They can pour all their time and resources into targeting this list while other campaigns cast broader nets. They can be the first to, to interact with confirmed voters, ask for their vote, and campaign against other candidates. By the time other candidates get an official list, voters have already made commitments, the opportunity for first impression is lost, and the pool has been poisoned against them. Every day with an official list is akin to campaigning for weeks without one. That's how significant it is. There is clear evidence that another campaign in my nomination race had access to not just an official membership list, but updated versions of it before the closing notice and before the candidate was greenlit. They didn't just have access to the list of members at the start of the contest, but were being updated with new members' names and contact information as other campaigns made sales. This is blatantly against the rules. Note, member data can only be pulled from the Conservative Party's tightly controlled Constituent Information Management System, CIMS. And if that rings a bell, it should, because there have been many scandals with regards to lists that have something to do with the Sims, specifically. The morning after the membership sales deadline, a mass email was sent to an updated version of the official membership list that no candidate was allowed to have yet. No one had been greenlit. The subject, quote, important info, Sabrina Maddo. It was full of defamatory spear attacks and deliberate misinformation about me. The email blast was sent via MailChimp by Norman McDaniel, who claimed to be a concerned conservative in Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. After his smear job, and targeted misinformation, he wrote, quote, Our community deserves better. We must not have someone like this as a candidate who does not share our values and will embarrass us should she make it to Parliament. Emphasis his. The email was forwarded to me not just by existing members, but even more concerning new members who, to whom we sold memberships in recent weeks. Sometimes old lists float around. This wasn't that. This email was sent to new members who had never been part of the Conservative Party before and would not appear on any old lists. Crucially, no one had ever heard of Norman McDaniel. 
Multiple members told me they felt harassed by this unknown center, didn't feel secure voting, and were concerned about both their data being compromised and the integrity of the election. I will post some of the notes we received in a separate thread. It was obvious why they might feel intimidated. An unknown entity had their confidential personal information and was attempting aggressively to influence their vote, which is also supposed to be confidential. Moreover, Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill is one of the 13 writings alleged to have been the target of foreign interference in 2021. Interesting they say that, eh? Mm -hmm. Multiple members filed complaints with the Privacy Commissioner, Elections Canada, and complained to the Conservative Party. We also shared these complaints as well as our own concerns with the party. As it turned out, Norman McDaniel, quote, is not a real person. After some pressure, the party confirmed there was no member in the writing with that name. Someone created a fake identity to impersonate a local writing member and spread a defamatory misinformation-filled smear campaign about me. They wanted to do this under the cloak of anonymity, posing as a fellow local conservative member to create a false sense of trust, credibility, and social proof. You'd think an anonymous person sending defamatory misinformation-filled emails to an updated membership list no one is supposed to have would concern the Conservative Party, particularly given recent headlines and hearings, as well as the writing's history. As one member... <coughs> wrote to me, quote, the smearing is either coming from an outside entity, which is highly concerning, or an inside entity, which is more concerning. We made rep repeated requests to the party to email members and, at minimum, inform them there appeared to be an unauthorized access to the membership list, that no person with the name Norman McDaniel was a writing member, and that they would ensure the integrity of the vote. They refused to do so. We were offered a vague promise they would look into the situation. While the party refused to act, the anonymous smear campaign continued three days after the first email was sent to members. I was sent to the list a second time. Remember, my campaign did not have access to an updated membership list and so couldn't as much as so much as defend ourselves or warn members about this clear attempt to interfere in the democratic process. After much more badgering, the party finally agreed to let us file an official complaint and initiate an investigation. Oh, the party had to agree for them to file a complaint. Does that oh. seem right to you? Because it doesn't yes. seem right to me. Yes. Okay, fine, fine. We'll allow you to complain. We did, submitting all our evidence as well as our member complaints. No next steps or timelines were given. The party still refused to inform members of anything. After the second email, another campaign approached us to say their recent membership sales had also received the smear email. We encouraged them to submit their complaint and evidence to the party, and they did. More silence. Part of this is reminding very much what happened to Mr. Burt Chen. Mm -hmm. yeah. When they decided to, to pitch him from the, the National Council. Yeah, His name has been in the news lately as well because people are wondering whether or not he is... Um, yeah somewhat behind certain things yeah we're not gonna we're not gonna go into it we don't know we don't know we haven't, we haven't spoken to mr chen since we last interviewed him so we have no insight but it was just interesting because people were wondering and then he denied it at the time that he was up to anything and it just seemed that he'd been completely railroaded and whoops a couple of a year and something later it's like oh well <clears throat> this is news he still denies, by the way, being yeah. part of, uh, of anything. Uh, but uh, he was the first one to call for, uh, first one inside the party to call for uh, Aaron O'Toole to be uh, given the ejection seat. Mm -hmm. right. Well, he did it quite publicly. It was yeah, so he did it publicly. He was, it wasn't underhanded. No, it wasn't behind the scenes. It was public. He, he asked for it in public, in the public forum, and then yep. they booted him from the party. Yep. yep. He was disloyal. Mm. Yeah. Something else interesting began to happen. We began to receive reports that one campaign's volunteers were showing up at doors of members we recently sold to. This was no random canvassing. Remember, membership sales were closed. This was targeted canvassing with the goal of influencing members' votes. We heard other campaigns' new members were also being targeted. A third campaign now complained to the party, as did we again. Now, see, the part that frustrates me with all of this is that they're willing to go public with all of this. All of these things have happened. They complained to the party, and they will not tell us which candidate has benefited. It's like, you've already suspended your campaign, whatnot. Just say the name of the candidate that's being favored. If you want people to really pay attention to it, you got to put a name. All right? We always had our suspicions, but it was now pretty clear which campaign had an updated membership list and was behind the smear attacks. Moreover, volunteer, volunteers showing up at these doors were using near-identical talking points as Norman McDaniel in his emails. Still, the party did nothing. 
Here I will drop a couple of relevant sections from the criminal code. Identity fraud, 403, I guess 403 section 1, I'm guessing. Everyone commits an offense who fraudulently, pers fraudulently personates another person living or dead. A, with intent to gain advantage for themselves or another person. B, with intent to obtain any property or an interest in any property. C, with intent to cause disadvantage to the person being personated or another person. Or D, with intent to avoid arrest of prosecution or to obstruct, pervert, or defeat the course of justice. Also, false information. Everyone commits an offense who, with intent to injure or alarm, refers per... Or, or, Sorry, let's try that again. Everyone commits an offense who, with intent to injure or alarm a person, conveys information that they know is false or causes such information to be conveyed by letter or any means of telecommunication. So uh, she's basically saying crimes have happened here. She hasn't all outright said crimes are happening here. She says, but uh, let me point out some relevant sections of the criminal code that might be uh, in a in play here. Credible evidence and suspicion that a candidate was guilty of not just breaking the party's nomination rules or engaging in highly unethical conduct but potentially committed a criminal offense should obviously be taken incredibly seriously. Candidates have been disqualified for much less. Instead, the candidate whose campaign we suspect was greenlit by the party on Monday evening, I was also greenlit that night. Now, Nearly two weeks after the first email went out, there have been no updates on the investigation, still no steps or timelines given, and no communications to voters or candidates about the matter. As a result, it's impossible to have faith in this election's integrity or that it will be an open and fair nomination. Without action by the party, the democratic process has been irrevocably corrupted and rigged in one candidate's favor. And then she goes on and says, I'd like to thank my team. And, you know, and she ends with the call that she made in, uh, uh, in, in the video. Uh, for the party to secure the democratic nomination process. Um, the communications person for the Conservative Party of Canada, Sarah Fisher, uh, she of uh, boxed water and uh, thinking that the sounds of honking trucks are beautifully melodious, some way, uh, didn't really take kindly to Sabrina uh, Mado actually making that comment, uh, posting on Twitter. The allegations Sabrina Mado made are completely false. The Conservative Party received a complaint from her campaign about emails being circulated to members in the writing, highlighting things Miss Mado has written and said in the past. It's common for the party to receive complaints from nomination candidates about their competitors, competitors over suspicions of wrongdoing and the use of lists. In fact, we received a complaint about, about Miss Meadow's campaign sending out an email to current and former members of the party when she should have not had access to a membership list. So, basically, uh, she is saying that... Um, you did it too, but offering no proof of that whatsoever, uh, that it's, oh yeah, we get complaints like this all the time. You shouldn't. That should be a sign <laughs> that your organization is rather sloppy. Uh, and then she's claiming, of course, they're false without offering any proof. And for me, I'm sitting there going, we'll prove it. Because the, uh, as far as I'm concerned, from where I sit, the Conservative Party of Canada has showed many, 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 many times that it is simply incapable of running a clean race. So from where I sit, even though I'm not a fan of either of these two parties or these two entities involved in this scuffle or dispute, until the Conservative Party of Canada can present proof based on track record alone, I have to believe Sabrina Maddow. Yep, get Mr. Cal claiming she should not have had access to the list, but going on, but but saying nothing about the person who did. Yep. Well, of course, she's denying. Right? She's denying that the lists were ever handed out. And 
that makes the end part. In fact, we received a complaint about Miss about Miss Badeau's campaign sending out an email to current and former members of the party when she should not have had access to a membership list. It's kind of like a kick in the nuts in the way, you know, in a way, because if you're making the statement that the allegations are completely false, that there were no lists that were circulated earlier, then why would you mention that, well, her campaign got a complaint? About using a list that apparently was not circulated according to Sarah. So why would you mention it? Yeah. Not uh, not impressed by this at all in any way, shape, or form. At all. This uh, should not be happening. And this is really, really important uh, because, like I said, I'm... Tr- this was a writing that was affected in 2021. It's a writing that is being uh, studied uh, within the Foreign Interference Public Commission. And uh, last week, uh, Justice Jose Ma- Barry Jose Ugg, uh, the report that she issued, the interim report, contained a warning. Quote, party nominations can be a gateway for foreign interference. Uh, this is based on a, a global news article by Alex Boutillier. Here, uh, quote, that's because parties are largely left to set the rules or enforce them or not, free of the kind of independent oversight given to general elections. There was also the concern that emerged over the course of the Hogue inquiry that security agencies like the Canadian Security Intelligence Service may not be as familiar with the, uh, let's say, questionable tactics employed by domestic political actors in hot fought nomination races. Quote, my concern was more that perhaps CSIS didn't understand as deeply as political actors do the prevalence of busing or of different community groups in nomination campaigns, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau told the inquiry on April 10th, referring to intelligence about alleged irregularities during the 2019 Don Valley North Liberal nomination. I believe we played this clip for you when we went over the Prime Minister's testimony on the show. There's some validity to that. More than 30 years ago, the Lorty Commission on Democratic Reform called attention to, quote, the decentralized nature of responsibility for nomination contests themselves. So these parties have been warned 30 years ago about this. 30 years. Wasn't important enough for them to do anything about it then, though. Just saying. Quote, the decentralized approach to nominations in Canada makes it more difficult to ensure women are better represented in the House of Commons, Lortie's report found. Quote, because it requires the full commitment and cooperation of local associations. The different parties and their local associations all have different approaches to nomination contests. There's no centralized standards or enforcement or uniform rules. But Hogg's caution comes at a time when the stakes for interference are arguably much higher, when regimes with hostile intent are trying to subvert the democratic process. Hugg's report makes clear that the nomination process itself is vulnerable, but the major federal parties seem to be very reluctant to address the situation. Quote, parties are their own private clubs, and that's how the courts view them when they, where they can set their own rules, said Fred Delory, the former national campaign manager for the Conservative Party, in an interview with Global News. And that's a good thing, Delory said. Parties need to be able to run their own vetting or greenlight processes for candidates to ensure that the prospective MPs align with the party's principles and won't embarrass them in the middle of an election campaign with any skeletons in their closet. Uh, Yes, well, those are all things that you should do before you vet them and give them the okay to run in the race. But once they've got the okay to run in the race, you should stop interfering. You don't approve them to run in the race and then continue doing the background checks and then try to make their lives hell. Do the background check first. Perhaps. Maybe. But in the absence of any real oversight, Canadians are left to take parties at their word that they're taking the threat of foreign influence and nominations seriously. Hogg's report doesn't explicitly lay out her reasoning that nominations are a potential gateway for foreign influence, but a close reading of the report's main case study, the 2019 Liberal nomination in Don Valley North, pointed to some reasons why she could be concerned. The report considered allegations, first reported by Global News, that the People's Republic of China, PRC, allegedly attempted to tilt the nomination process in candidate Han Dong's favor. 
Those allegations detailed in Hoke's report include that the PRC officials in Canada contrived to bus in, bus in international students to support Dong, who were both ineligible to vote and allegedly coerced into supporting the Liberal nominee. Quote, before the 2019 election, intelligence reporting, though not firmly substantiated, indicated that Chinese international students would have been bussed into the nomination process in support of Han Dong, and that individuals associated with a known PRC proxy agent provided students with falsified documents to allow them to vote, despite not being residents of Don Valley North, the report read. The report noted that the information came from a variety of sources and had, quote, various levels of corroboration. In his testimony at the Hogue Inquiry, Dong said that if he was made aware of international students improperly voting in his nomination, he would have put a stop to it. Quote, I don't pay attention to busing international students because I didn't understand it as an irregularity, he said. Doug's, Dong's campaign manager, Ted Loiko, testified that he too knew nothing about the busload of students. The 2019 contest would hardly be the first time a campaign has been accused of benefiting from bust-in voters, or the first allegation of ineligible citizens attempting to vote in a nomination contest, however. Allegations of dirty tricks and party leadership tilting a nomination contest for the preferred candidate are likely as old as nomination contests themselves. What appears new is foreign states like China, Iran, or India using the same kind of questionable tactics employed by domestic political operatives for decades. Hoag's report, so basically, what we're saying here is um, Conservative Party of Canada and uh, politicians trying to make hay over the foreign interference thing. Um, don't be mad now. You showed China, Iran, and India how to do it by leaving those rules loose in the first place. And you guys played fast and loose with them when you wanted to rig nominations in certain favors. You showed them how. They watched you do it. They're just doing what you did. The only difference is that they're from outside the country and you're from inside the country. But um, if something is illegal, immoral, ethical, unethical, um, it's still illegal, immoral, and unethical whether someone from within or without the country is doing it. Just saying. <laughs> uh, while just as Hug might be clear on that, Quote, sorry, sorry, uh, I skipped a couple of paragraphs there, sorry. Hoag's report makes clear that the nomination process itself is a vulnerability when it comes to defending Canadian democracy from foreign meddling. Quote, this incident in Don Valley North makes clear the, the extent to which nomination contests can be gateways for foreign states who wish to interfere in our democratic process, Hoag's report read. While Justice Hug might be clear upon that, what's less clear is what can be done to prevent it. If a foreign country wanted to covertly influence Canadian politics, it could take the risky route of meddling in a general election, which is held when security agencies and election officials are on high alert and the public is paying more attention. Or they could look at nomination contests in so-called safe seats, a conservative seat in Alberta, for instance, or a liberal seats in the heart of downtown Toronto, and attempt to influence who wins the nomination. In those seats, winning the nomination can almost guarantee heading to Ottawa. At the federal level, nominations are largely left up to the parties themselves with almost no independent oversight or contests of the contests. Sorry, Elections Canada has a limited role in monitoring financial returns for compliance, it does not adjudicate disputes over alleged questionable tactics, let alone probe possible instances of foreign interference. There's a good reason for that, according to Delory. Quote, if a party wants to change the rules and just appoint candidates, they can do that. It's really not the place of Elections Canada or any other entity to weigh in on that. The party needs to take its own responsibility to its membership and to its founding or current values and apply it that way, he said. Rather than bring in an outside oversight, Delory said that parties need to take Hoag's caution that nominations can be a vector for foreign meddling seriously and approach their own processes accordingly. Ah, yes, the old volunteer method. Voluntary compliance, because that always works so well. Jack Siegel, a lawyer with a long history of involvement with the Liberal Party, shares this view. As someone who says he has personally overseen more than 100 nominations, Siegel wondered how party volunteers are expected to scrutinize nomination contests for potential foreign interference. Quote, if we're to look at these factors, and I suspect that we need to ask, how are we going to get that information? That's, what, that's where you wanted to deal with the process and the challenge that we're facing, beyond at the level of individual member or applicant for membership to the party, Siegel said in an interview. Quote, because at that point, the numbers and ability to implement reasonable controls take you far, certainly beyond what you would be my comfort zone. 
How are we going to get this right? Because remember, every time you get it wrong, you're turning away someone who is eligible. You're turning them away from the political process. Global News reached out to the Liberals, Conservatives, and New Democrats to ask if they would be in favor of an increased oversight into their nomination processes. None of the parties addressed that question. Gee, I wonder why. A Liberal Party spokesperson claimed in a statement that the party had the, quote, most robust nomination rules in Canadian politics, quote, all of our candidates who have taken part in an open nomination contest have been nominated by local registered Liberals in processes that have been fully in line with all of our no national nomination rules and that were in place at the time of their nomination. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, in processes that have been fully in line with all of our national nomination rules is kind of the point here. The national nomination rules are a little porous, if we're going to be generous. Just a tiny bit porous. In a statement provided by a spokesperson, basically what I'm saying here, kids, is that uh, no, 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 everything's fine. We have a robust system, absolutely robust system. All of our super lax rules were really followed to the letter. <laughs> it's just come on man in a statement provided by a spokesperson ndp national director lucy watson called their nomination process quote rigorous yeah but that's not the point the point is is it rigorous enough quote after each election a committee is struck by our federal council to review the last election's nomination process and develop the rules for the next election these rules are reflective of our values and priorities for example we have strict criteria to ensure equity in our candidate search process watson is quoted as saying we welcome justice hoax interim report and we will be examining the recommendations closely we're committed to ensuring our party's measures always ensure a fair and democratic nomination process but not so much that we would like to have an independent oversight We're committed to ensuring our party's measures always ensure a fair and democratic nomination process. But not always. Not always, because you don't want the independent oversight that would make sure that always actually happens. Right. All three parties sidestep the question because all three parties see it in their personal interest to be able to play fast and loose with the rules. And when the, that, that guy saying, he says, oh, well, we have to keep the rules, you know, a little less formal. We can't have oversight, says Fred Delory. Like, what happens if a party decides they just simply want to appoint everyone? Well, they can just put it in the rules. The party reserves the right to appoint, make it part of the rules, transparent, and what the process is for canceling a nomination race and going to a straight appointment. Having independent oversight doesn't prevent you from doing that. It just means that you have to codify the rules and the process for it to happen. And then you got to follow it. Which makes it harder to play fast and rule, fast and loose with the rules. If you actually have a process for how it is that you're supposed to go about it, you just don't wake up one day and say, oh, sorry, we're appointing now. Thank you. Or, sorry, we've decided to appoint, but we can. We've got to maintain the illusion of an actual Democratic nomination race. So uh, here, Guy will just like send you all the updated membership lists, and you can go to work right now, and we'll just uh, uh, put a ball and a chain, really, really heavy ball, around everybody else's ankles and uh, let you get a two-week head start. How's that sound? Jeez, 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 jeez. Sarah Fisher... Again, the director of communications for the Conservative Party did not respond to a request for comment. She did post on social media Thursday, however, about accusations of improper, impropriety, sorry, impropriety in the Conservative nomination contest in Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill, which was the one we were just talking about. And then they go on and they talk about Sabrina Maddow in here, saying that, uh, again, say that she said that the claims were false, but uh, didn't provide any proof of that. Quote, this is the kind of bog standard spat Canadians tend to see in nomination contests, particularly in writings where the candidate has a good chance of winning the seat. One veteran political insider told Global that it's a common saying in nominations that if you don't have the membership list, you likely don't have a chance. 
in the absence of actual oversight, the Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill nomination won't be the last contest to see this type of complaint, and Canadians will be left to take it on faith that parties can guard against more insidious forms of interference themselves. It appears that not only they can't, but they don't want to. Yay! So next time you see a conservative belly up to a mic and complain about, oh my God, this foreign interference and the results may have been skewed and we can't trust the elections. It's like, uh, yeah. And you're allowing potentially bought and paid for candidates to run in safe seats. How funny that is. Huh? Because you won't clean up your nomination process and you won't subject yourselves to independent oversight. Don't blame China. I'm saying, hey, listen, I understand that it's Canada. And you should have the right to leave your house with the doors unlocked and the windows all open for a two-week vacation and expect everything to still be there. But your insurance company isn't going to care if you didn't lock the doors. <laughs> you left all the windows open and then you just left. <laughs> They're not going to settle your claim. You didn't do the minimum to protect yourself. The door came with a lock. The windows came with a lock. The windows go up and down. You close the windows, you close the doors, and you, and you lock them. Mm -hmm. There's a minimum amount surgery. of responsibility. Yeah. So, basically, the federal parties, when it comes to their nomination, which is like this huge gateway for all types of shenanigans... Yeah. We need the flexibility to be able to maintain. To get, we need to keep that that way because we need the flexibility to make sure that our races are true, true races. Yeah. Again, tons of real estate on the North Shore of Alberta and Saskatchewan to sell you. Uh, yeah, oceanfront property in northern Saskatchewan. I am just seriously. My boots, my boots are made of genuine Saskatchewan seal skin. Mm. You, you may have missed it, Mr. Grizzly. I'm not sure if you were able to hear, but it seems that uh, uh, Global asked all three parties. Said, "Well, would you be open?" to independent oversight, like from Elections Canada or Elections Ontario, Elections Alberta, whatnot, for your nominators. So all three parties gave an answer, but sidestepped that question. Of course they did. But they're all out there trying to, they're, in the, oh, they're all out there in a virtue contest trying to make us believe that one is less or more virtuous than the other on this front. Uh, <clears throat> in other uh, conservatives, we really even shouldn't mention this. Oh, yeah. To be well, totally we honest. Week. We did last week. Yeah, I'm not sure. Did we? Yeah, we did. I showed the video. Oh, you showed the video? Okay. Yeah. We, then we, we won't made, show it again. We, we, can, we don't no, have to. No, we we can to. if you want. But no, no, it was no, like, really? This is, this is we, what you Yeah, we, we did show it, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'd say I, I'd already, it was already so insignificant to me that I forgot that mm. we had done it last Friday. Um, We're talking yes. about Lisa Rude and her uh, Tim yeah, Horton's Leanne coffee Rude. cup boy. Leanne Rood, Tim, yeah. Tim Horton's coffee cup boycott because she doesn't like the paper tops. Yes. I'm like, oh, lady. Yes. I mean, <sighs> yes. And, the, you know, she could and it was an official party statement too, right? Because she, right, put, yes, she had her, her logo on the bottom. It's like, lady. Your personal Yelp reviews should not be done on government time with government resources. Two, you have an expense account. Buy yourself a reusable cup. Solve your problem. <laughs> Next. <laughs> it's like, lady, you're the elected representative. We shouldn't be having to tell you how to solve your own problems. You're the one who's supposed to have the answers. Jeez. <clears throat> yeah. Seriously. Um, Friday, before we left, uh, after we left the show, I should say, um, 
employment data was released. Uh, Canada unexpectedly added 90,000 jobs in April. Uh, this is the second month in a row now that they keep on telling us that uh, job creation is going to be very, very, very low, and then it really surprises to the upside. Uh, of course, uh, the unemployment rate stayed flat at 6.1%. It didn't go down because despite having a gang best, gangbuster jobs report, um, because of uh, Im current immigration rates, uh, the jobs uh, Jobs are basically basically being created at a pace to just basically maintain uh, population growth or to, to respond to population growth. Um, but uh, only 20,000 jobs were being predicted by the economists. So that's more than four times greater, uh, according to the last labor force survey numbers for statistics, sorry, for statistics Canada. The federal agency pinned the increases in employment on part-time work with more than 50,000 of those types of positions. There were more jobs in the professional, scientific, and technical services industries. As well, employment for those aged 15 to 24 went up by 40,000 in April, the first monthly increase for that demographic since September 2022. Wow. So maybe that's one of the reasons. Here, here, here you know, we're talking about the reasons like, why are all the youth so angry and pissed off and why are they all flocking to Polyev and whatnot? Well, yeah, maybe somewhere in the last two, in the last year and a half, they could have mentioned that the, the, employment, the employment rate for 15 to 24 hadn't increased once since December 2022. That might have something to do with the angst. <laughs> you think? However, the unemployment rate was unchanged from the month before, staying at 6.1%. That's higher than a year ago. Quote, within these numbers is a strong employment growth, but also strong population growth, CIBC senior economist Andrew Grantham told CBC News, explaining why the unemployment rate was stable despite higher job growth. More people are also actively employed or looking for work in Canada, with April's 0.1% increase the first since June 2023. So most more people are are actually declaring themselves to be uh, in the market looking for a job as well. So more people working and more people claiming that they're looking for work. So I'm guessing they're seeing that the environment for work is positive because they're actually joining the active force uh, pool of people looking for work. That matches the experience of Dan Hong, owner of Aso Fine Foods in Toronto, who told CBC News his company is growing these days and struggling to hire enough staff. Quote, we're willing to train, but unfortunately, it's been very challenging to find people to work, he said. We could use 20 to 30 people at any given time, he added, because his business operates in cities such as London, Toronto, and Ottawa. Statistics Canada said private sector employment went up in April after four months of little change. Grantham noted that while employment growth over the past year has been partly driven by the public sector, April's numbers show an encouraging move. So you'll hear that a lot in conservative circles complaining. So yeah, we're growing jobs, but almost all the jobs are in the public sector. Can't believe we added 280,000 jobs last year in the public sector. So yeah, uh, well, yeah, okay, okay, so you could understand that. I, you know, you probably want more private sector job if you're a conservative than the public sector jobs because because, well, that costs us money. Uh, but when you live in a country where the population is growing at a clip of about a million a year, um, and you're living in a G7 country, that uh, uh, a very advanced G7 country, which tends to offer very advanced services to its people and a lot of services <clears throat> to its people, mm -hmm. if we count all levels of government together, roads, sewers, traffic lights, all these various services that we use, that are very, very high quality. Yeah, I, I, I can see it taking several, several, several people. I mean, on a cruise ship, what is like, there's like four staff to every <clears throat> passenger or something like this. Why wouldn't there be a public servant for every four new Canadians? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> of course, there's more public set, more people to serve, more public servants. Yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand, right? Right. <laughs> but this time around, we did see quite a significant increase in private sector hiring, which was good news from an economic point of view. Pardon me, I have to cough. Okay, you do that. Mm. The employment rate, or the percentage of the population that's employed, was also steady at 61.4%, which stats can pointed out comes after six consecutive months of drops. That rate was also nearly 1% one, nearly 1 lower in April 2024 than the year before, as population growth in Canada was higher than employment growth. 
Uh, these numbers come after a loss of 2,200 jobs in March, with that month's unemployment rate showing the largest increase since summer 2022. Grantham said that for the majority of people, this data is good news because the country is adding jobs, but measures that contribute to inflation, such as wage growth, are starting to come down. Average hourly wages went up th to $34.95 an hour. That's a 4.7 increase compared to April 2023. However, that's a lower increase than March, which saw wages jump 5.1%. It's true, but considering that the last time we did core inflation, it came in at 2.9%, wages are still growing 1.6% faster than inflation percent faster than inflation at the moment. So we are still in the phase where we're catching up a lot of the ground that people lost. A lot of them are making them up with a, with a <coughs> wage increases now at this point, which is good. The Bank of Canada will be taking this report into account as it determines whether it will change interest rates in the decision next month. People are sort of going back and forth. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any full consensus in the economic sector, in the, the banking sector, whether or not this is going to lead to a rate cut in June or July. Instead, a, a little bit of a delay. Uh, because uh, these are strong numbers for job creation, and the Bank of Canada is trying to get unemployment to go up a little bit to, uh, so that there's less money sloshing around the economy and it's uh, not as hot. Um, but uh, if we, the, on the economic side, Right. We had mentioned the other week uh, that the governor, Tiff Macklem, had said, you know, things are going pretty well and it's looking more and more and more like we are actually going to hit that soft landing that everybody has wanted. Uh, so with economics, low economic growth, you know, below 2%, uh, sometimes maybe even below 1%, but like below 2%, you know, uh, wage growth that is decreasing, uh, even though it is still higher than inflation, um, Job numbers that are good, uh, but not good enough to lower the unemployment rate. All of those things are things that the bank does want to see this in order to uh, drop interest rates. So um, from my perspective, it's looking pretty good for now that a rate cut will come in June, but we'll have inflation data come on the 21st. And if inflation in Canada starts going up again, like it has been going up in the U.S. for a little while, because uh, there was a while where the U.S. had a lower infl infl inflation rate than we did. Uh, and now it's the other way around. Ours is at 2.9 and theirs is at 3.6. So, um and we already have a deviation on the interest rate with the central bank. We already have a quarter of a point uh, deviation as it is right now. So, um, and uh, economists are saying that we can go to a maximum of probably about one full percentage point before it starts having uh, negative impacts on our dollar. So uh, we'll watch uh, all of these things. Uh, CBIBC's Grantham said the central bank could still cut rates in June, even with job growth being stronger than expected, though economists from other institutions such as Citibank are projecting a July rate cut specific what I said here. Um, so June or July, everybody was pretty much certain that it was going to happen for June for sure. Now there is more people claiming maybe it'll be another month more. Uh, but you equally, you have people on the other side saying like, hey, <coughs> Tiff Macklem, you waited too long to start raising the interest rates in the first place. Don't wait too long to bring them down. So there's, there, but there's no, there's no real consensus. It's not like 80% of the market is saying, yep, yeah, June for sure. Uh, but so far, it seems that things are still on track for some time this summer. In the United States, they are not. That's been pushed back. It seems that they're more on track for probably November. Um, but right now in Canada, the, the consensus still seems to be probably three rate cuts before the end of this year at some point. Oh, that'll be interesting. Uh, yeah. Did you It'll see? Needed. Uh, <clears throat> did you see the uh, the tweet that was brought back up from Melissa Lansman? Oh, days I, ago. I did not. Well, well, you know how she rails on about how Trudeau is creating inflation because of the Bank of Canada that he makes, blah, 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 blah. She had a tweet from 2015 when they said, what can you do about the interest rates? He goes, uh, we have a hands-off approach. Uh, we don't touch the Bank of Canada. They set the interest rates on their own. It has nothing to do with us. So when she's in power, you know, the conservatives were in power. That's how it was. But if the liberals are in power, they're the ones setting the rate which we all know is a crock of. Mm. Yeah. 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 Ugh, these people. Too convenient. Let's see if I can find it. I thought I bookmarked it. Let me see. All right. 
I'll pass you another uh, video clip here there, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, interesting thing happened uh, on Friday as well. Uh, I wanted to mention it uh, while we were talking about the Israel and Gaza stuff, but there was a video clip and uh, Mr. Grizzly was uh, not around for me to show it. But uh, there was a vote uh, at the United Nations General Assembly on, um, I'm guessing it was uh, to recognize, uh, uh, not so much to recognize Palestinian statehood, but to um, give Palestine, I guess, more full membership to the UN General Assembly, because right now it has observer status and it has certain limited rights. And it seems that there is a bigger push from the international community to start giving it full rights uh, so that it could play a bigger role at the UN. Um, the vote was 143 for, nine against, with 25 abstentions. Uh, the US <coughs> vetoed a similar motion last month at the UN Security Council. So the General Assembly is the, the larger body. Um, the United States and Israel, of course, uh, voted uh, against it. Um, but Canada broke from its traditional position of voting with the U.S. and Israel, uh, didn't vote against, but was one of the 25 nations to abstain. Uh, even if it had passed, however, the security, uh, uh, the, the General Assembly, the resolution would have then had to go to the Security Council to be approved. And as we just mentioned, the U.S. vetoed a similar motion last month at the Security Council. So it wasn't going to go anywhere. Uh, but uh, primetime politics covered it, and I want to play you the bit of the report and uh, the section where they have a very uh, lengthy quote from our ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray, explaining what Canada's position is, because a lot of people in the press saw Canada abstain and said, oh, you cowards, and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, um, again, if you say Canada abstains and disassociate it from anything else, you might think they're a coward. But if Canada's position traditionally would have been to vote against this, and in this case, they chose to abstain, that's a huge policy shift. Mm -hmm. we broke with the United States to go our own way a little bit. Now, I'm sure we probably consulted the United States before we did that. Because uh, you have to understand that in this particular situation, uh, President Joe Biden is really not happy. The attack on Central World Kitchen. Mm-hmm convoy was a really, really big thing because the chef, uh, Jose Andres, is a very close personal friend of President Biden. I didn't know that. Oh, yes, yes. During the Obama presidency with Central World Kitchen and, uh, and the administration got very, very close because I think that was probably around the time where Jose Andres started doing his things. He's been at it for about 10 years now, I think, uh, just going to disaster zones and uh, helping. Uh, you know, they had to, uh, you know, um, Hurricane Sandy and other things in the United States. So he was working a lot in the United States first and, you know, made a big name for himself. So they, uh, um, you know, received a whole bunch of accolades and whatnot. So, uh, Miss, yeah, President Biden considers him to be a personal friend. All right. Uh, let's go into, let's uh, see the report, uh, Mr. Grizzly. Okay, just a second here. Since the new software update, things are not working like they once Hello, everyone. Did. I'm Michael Serapio. <laughs> The General Assembly of the United Nations voted overwhelmingly on Friday to grant the Palestinian delegation full membership to the global body. Oops, uh, apologies, Kits, uh, because we're the doing United remote. The United States vetoed a similar move last month at the... We're getting pauses now and then, as you can hear. <laughs> I think that has to do with the feed. The UN Security the Council, but in the Assembly, one... Oh, come on. It's, uh, it's not my... It's, three countries voted in favor of the Palestinian bid, and only nine countries voted against it. The nays included the U.S. and Israel, but Canada broke away from its traditional allies by choosing to abstain. 
Take a listen now to Canada's ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray, as he outlines this country's reasonings. Mr. President, an immediate ceasefire is urgently needed. Hostages must be released. Rapid, safe, and unimpeded humanitarian relief must be provided to civilians. Israel should refrain from further mili military operations in Rafah, which are already bringing devastating humanitarian consequences. Canada's approach to this crisis and to this vote today is guided by three key principles. The first is that Israel has the right to exist and to defend itself in accordance with international law. Second, that the Palestinian people must be able to realize their right to self-determination. And third, that the protection of civilians everywhere, not just on both sides of this conflict, but in all conflicts everywhere, that that protection is paramount and a strict requirement under international humanitarian law. As the General Assembly has considered granting additional privileges for the Palestinian delegation at the United Nations, recommending that the Security Council consider, reconsider full United Nations membership for Palestine, Canada has decided to abstain today. Let me explain why. We agree with confirming the enhanced participation of Palestinian representatives in the UN. And I must say personally, I have appreciated the flexibility that the Palestinian delegation has shown in finalizing this resolution. We had good, fair, frank, and detailed discussions, and I think they have produced a better resolution as a result. But we still have concerns with this resolution despite best efforts, hence our abstention. It goes too far in determining that Palestinian statehood and a right to full membership has actually, on the ground, in reality, as opposed to in aspiration, that this has actually been achieved. The other fact which we must come to grips with, that Hamas, which uh, many states, including Canada, consider to be a terrorist organization, a view that is totally confirmed by their behavior on October the 7th, it currently controls areas in Gaza an essential part of the territory of the future state of Palestine. Hamas continues to hold hostages, has yet to lay down its arms or end its violent opposition to the existence of Israel. All Palestinians deserve to be led by a legitimate and representative government without the participation of a terrorist organization. At the same time, the Netanyahu government has made clear in its words and in its actions that it rejects the two-state solution. Illegal settlements and settler violence in the West Bank are growing at alarming rates, often with impunity. We believe there must be continued progress towards Palestinian self-determination, and we will not and cannot afford to give up. It is clear that we must urgently rebuild a credible path to achieving the two-state solution one that gives hope to both Palestinians and Israelis that they may live side by side in peace, security, and dignity. That process cannot delay indefinitely the creation of a Palestinian state. Canada is prepared to recognize the state of Palestine at the time that is most conducive to lasting peace, and let me make it clear, not necessarily as the last step along that path. There is still work to be done, but Canada's commitment to the two-state solution, including recognition of the state of Palestine when it is appropriate, is very much there. We will also continue to support efforts towards peace and regional stability. We will maximize pressure on Hamas and the Iranian regime, including through sanctions. We will impose sanctions on extremist settlers. We will support strengthening the Palestinian Authority and the introduction of reforms to deliver for Palestinians. We are further committed to supporting the recovery and reconstruction of Gaza in the context of a sustainable peace. The solution also needs to be regional, and it also needs to include the full integration of Israel in the Middle East. Canada will continue working with the international community and will keep at the center of its efforts the need for long-term security guarantees for Israel as well as the national aspirations of Palestinians. Together, we must redouble our efforts to fully realize the vision 
that was first articulated by the General Assembly in 1947. We owe it to the Israeli and Palestinian peoples who deserve a brighter future and a sustainable peace. Peace requires, above all, empathy. It requires an understanding of every nation's and every people's search for dignity and for recognition. Let's be very clear. There are many states which still today do not recognize the state of Israel. It has been a member nation of the United Nations since 1948. At the same time, it has taken us a long time to provide Palestinians with the recognition that they deserve to allow them to become a member of not only this organization, but of others. As I said, that work still rests to be done. But in order to do it, it is going to require a leap of faith and imagination that takes us past some of the words we've heard spoken here today. We must all understand that not all Palestinians are terrorists. And it's important for us to understand that Israelis are a people <clears throat> whose deep suffering, confirmed today earlier in the week with the commemoration of Yom HaShoah, deserve their place as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray. Now, the UN Security Council is being asked by the General Assembly to consider the matter favorably, as full membership must first be approved by the UN Security Council. Israel, for its part, is condemning the General Assembly's move. All right. Um, so then again, um, Bob Ray delivering a set of thoughtful comments uh, looking at both sides of the issue uh, breaking with the United States but not going all in as well so again the classic sort of honest broker position being able to maintain a camp uh, you know some compliments from the de delegation of Palestine that had shown good faith efforts uh, to make the resolution better, but still, sorry, can't go all the way with you. Right. Um, it's a position that's going to make a lot of people unhappy. Oh, yes. Okay. Should have gone all the way. You're a coward. Why not? Just, but just remember where we started from. This is a step. Yes. And in international affairs on the global scene, because to us at home, we're sitting there and it's like, you know, wow, well, oh, gee, they only upstate how weak what's off like this. When some, when a nation changes position like that, it, it's a big deal. There's a reason everybody in the room was quiet. when Bob Ray was stating its position. One, it's because it's Canada, and we are respected. Two, he is respected individually. Oh, yes. Three, and we broke with our position, our normal position. We had done something new. So everybody went, mm hmm Mm-hmm. Yes. On that stage, in that world, to us out in the lay world, this doesn't seem like a big deal. In that world, that's a BFD, what just happened. Yes. That's the type of thing that sends like little shock waves. Just like when, you know, U.S. President Joe Biden told uh, President ben, uh, ben, Prime Minister ben, ben, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, if you continue down this path or if you break a red line, we will no longer be supplying you with offensive weapons. And then word has uh, gotten out that uh, since March, since March, there are certain shipments of things that have been approved but have either been slow walked or gotten there slowly and 
I think uh, just recently it was announced that uh, any to any of those 2,000 pound or greater bombs that Israel uh, really needs uh, to sort of bust up the tunnels, the underground tunnels. Um, they've been approved and the money's been approved, but uh, nobody's signed the kind of export slip, I'm guessing, for them to go. So not only has President Biden threatened, but he's actually followed through. So even the United States is breaking with traditional United States positions. Stay tuned, kids. This is about to get really interesting. Yeah, things are changing rapidly because this is uh, not normal, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when was the last time we ever did this? This is a first, is it not? I, I don't remember in my lifetime ever Canada voting different from the United States at the UN on a matter having to do with Israel. I don't. It may have happened, but I don't remember. None come to mind. Uh, other news that will, uh, uh, that should make national headlines, unless it's going to be treated the same way as uh, the Tamara Leach, Leach trial, <clears throat> uh, which doesn't seem to be getting a lot of coverage. But uh, Pat King goes on trial today. Kids and Cubs. That's been taking a long time. Happy trial day to you. Happy trial day to you. Happy trial day. Happy trial day. Don't say you're guilty, you fool. Okay. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly. Uh, so, yes, uh, the gentleman from Red Deer is facing charges of mischief, intimidation, obstructing police, and disobeying a court order, among others. He was arrested in 2022, and uh, it took him, he was not granted bail immediately, and it uh, took him a while to find a surety that um, the court would be, that would satisfy the court, because he remained in jail for about five months before he was finally allowed out. Uh, so he was determined dangerous enough to be kept in jail, and then... Uh, had to, you know what I sometimes say, um, pity some of these people rather than being mad because they're in a dark, sad, lonely place and a lot of them don't have enough people that love them clearly in their circles to let them know. When you have to be in jail for five months because there's nobody in your immediate life or circle that can be a good to a, a, a surety for you, well, that sh well, first of all, that you're in jail should probably have you asking some life questions. <laughs> but when you're in jail, because, and there's nobody, after X number of years, I don't know how long, how old this guy is, but let's say 40-something years on the planet, you don't have anybody in your life. That a court of law will find acceptable to vouch and speak for you and say, yeah, I'll they can stay with me and I'll make sure they don't break the law while they're awaiting trial. I pity you. I pity you. That's the consequence of a long series of bad life choices. You think? <laughs> Uh, according to uh, CBC's David Fraser, one of the most polarizing figures to gain notoriety, to gain notoriety during what became known as the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa more than two years ago, will stand trial Monday, signaling the tail end of criminal proceedings that have dogged hundreds of individuals who participated in the historic protest. Pat King from Red Deer, Alberta, is facing charges, as I mentioned, mischief, intimidation, obstructing police, disobeying a court order, and other offenses for his role in the protest that gridlocked downtown for nearly a month in early 2022. Arrested and jailed for five months before his release this summer, King is unlikely to serve more time behind bars if he's found guilty, given the laws around credit for time served. 
Um, like other prominent convoy leaders, King's trial is expected to draw a sizable crowd outside the Ottawa courthouse. But unlike the trials of Tamara Leach and Chris Barber, King's defense won't be bankrolled by the Democracy Fund or the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, both well-mobilized entities with deep ties to liber libertarian and right-wing backers. So again, kits and cubs, I have to add to that. If after 40-something years on the planet, there is, you have no one in your life that will come to your aid to provide a surety, and the cause you took up, the cause for which you took up, the people that run the organization's legal defense funds there won't even come to your help after you've sacrificed and thrown your life away for them. Thrown your life away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's your telltale sign right there, right? Again, a long series of probably bad life decisions. I am just saying. Yikes. It, it, you know, it's, a sh it's a shame he's such a hateful person because he's he's quite charismatic. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's just such a hateful individual. It's it's you know, um, it's, it's a shame. I, I find the same thing with Jeremy McKenzie. Terrible human being. Charismatic. Has the ability to hold the attention of a room, but just terrible human beings. Yeah. Terrible life the, choices. Parker has the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Terrible life choices that have brought them to terrible places. And they're, you know, they they seem to think that that what they've done is is the way everybody seems to believe that it should be. But I'm like, that's the vast majority of Canadians uh, disagree with their their ideology and their mentality and their and their processes in trying to achieve their goals. And they've brought a lot of harm to a lot of people along the way, and and have preached harming people. And that's not how you win hearts and minds. It just, it really isn't. It's not the way to do it, you know? Yep. The article goes on. Similarly, many of the convoy supporters and even some of the original core organizers who once shouted slogans against vaccine mandates along King have abandoned or distanced themselves from the 46-year-old who is known for making incendiary remarks. He knows all of this perhaps better than anyone else. Quote, I'm about to go into the fight of my life, he told his social media audience on April 29th. King, who was granted permission to live stream online for fundraising purposes, admitted to supporters that in the final video before he traveled to Ottawa, he was looking forward to the end of the legal ordeal so he could return to some normalcy. Quote, it's been hard, he told supporters. And they are the direct consequences for choices you've made. So you yeah. have chosen, you have chosen a hard path. <clears throat> but this was your choice. A day later, he posted on Facebook, quote, My lawyer just contacted me that we are sitting at $9,037 in donations just from last night. I cannot thank you enough, he wrote. Without financial backing from any major advocacy, advocacy group, King has had to raise money mostly on his own, hosting events both in Alberta and Ontario. Prior to his most recent fundraiser in early May, he said he was around 60000 short of his goal, but King is hardly alone in this fight. On Facebook alone, King still draws 339,000 followers. Mm -hmm. Yikes, in a country of 41 million. <clears throat> Posting videos from events, including a highly publicized one featuring Alberta Premier Daniel Smith and former Fox News host Tucker Carlson in Calgary earlier this year. King was brought in as an early planner of the Freedom Convoy, conceived by an ad hoc group that connected online as a protest against vaccine mandates in January 2022. He had, after all, been involved in an earlier convoy to Ottawa in 2019. He helped organize the United We Roll, I believe that was the Yellow Vest thing, yes. movement in support of Canada's oil and gas sector. Inspired by protests in France over rising fuel costs, that event only attracted a few hundred people, but it set the stage for some of the challenges organizers of the Freedom Convoy would eventually encounter, notably how the main message was quickly diluted by others vying for the microphone. Like the much bigger lockdown of Ottawa in 2022, they include calls to arrest Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, as well as racist sentiments. King made headlines almost immediately when thousands of truckers and protesters started rallying to head to Ottawa. His online fame soared, buoyed by his antics in Red Deer, where he criticized COVID-19 mandates and protested against an anti-racism rally. Various fundraisers launched in support of the Freedom Convoy received millions of dollars in pledges before they were shut down by the online platform hosting them. And it goes on and goes on again. 
uh, old videos have resurfaced, which may cause him some trouble. Sensing his unpredictability and tendency to attract negative attention, however, Le Leech, Barber, and others sought to, dis dis to distance themselves from King as the weeks-long protest continued. News media scrambled to determine who best represented the movement as competing voices vied for clout and credit. As the public's attention on King intensified, some of his old videos resurfaced, snippets showing King mocking specific ethnicities, talking about the Anglo-Saxon race, quote, being one of the strongest bloodlines, and warning, quote, Trudeau, someone is going to make you catch a bullet one day. He has long maintained the videos were spliced and edited to make him look bad. No, they weren't. They were live feeds. But his statement spread, furthering the idea that the freedom... Yes, because apparently, yes, if you take out the five minutes between the time I said, Trudeau, somebody's going to come make you catch a bullet one day, and hit, hey, everybody, drive to Ottawa, the sentence, Trudeau, someone's going to make you catch a bullet one day, becomes less yeah. offensive. You still said it. <laughs> we saw you. <laughs> Spliced together to make me look bad. You did that all on your own. Going all through a going through a speech that you 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 put online, and taking out the five moments where you said something potentially illegal, and then put them together. He said this. He said this. He said this. He said this. Is not editing the video to make you look bad. There is nothing in between those statements that provides context that makes those statements less bad. Or oh well, gee, that seems totally normal and reasonable. Exactly. Exactly. And they seem to think, you know, uh, oh, those left wing, those left wing libtards are just making yes. me look bad by posting what I said online and, and making that's, it out of context. No, what you said online was terrible. Yeah, Period. that's like that's like when Sarah Palin went to visit the Paul Revere Museum when she was on vacation and a journalist came out and asked, so what did you think or what did you learn? And clearly she had learned nothing because she's had some historical inaccuracies in her response. And then later on, the next day, says, it was, it was a gotcha question. And the stand-up comedian said something. It was like, lady, it's not a gotcha question just because the question got ya. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's no. So again, Pat. <laughs> well, I, I tweeted out on the weekend about how, you know, uh, somebody was talking about the, the Leach trial is coming to a close and Pat King trial is about to. And I said, well, I thought, why aren't the uh, Polyev is all about jail, not bail. Why aren't these people in jail then? And of course, the, the troll bots come out of the woodwork going, he's talking about murderers and blah, blah, blah. I go, no, no, I'm, they failed to see hyperbole. Like I'm using his own words against him. I'm using his words that he said, jail, not bail. Yes, but now they care about precision. So he's only talking about murderers. I thought he was talking about people who broke the law. Yeah. It's like now they're being precise. I'm like, all right, fine. Now they Let's care. Now they want to be pedantic. Yeah. Yeah. That's the funny That's part. not precisely what he said. Oh, oh so saying. now you care about detail and nuance. Okay. Yeah. Only when it suits their, their bias confirmation echo chamber narrative. That's it. That's the only time they want to be pedantic. Oh, yeah, they, they, they were trying to pillory me, and I just laughed at all of them. And, yeah. and most of them are bots and trolls because they're anonymous, no face, uh, name with a bunch of numbers. I call them out as troll bots. Yeah. Somebody says, what's a troll bot? I'm like, you're online. Look it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Pat... <laughs> Just like it's not a gotcha question because the question gotcha, it's not an edited video just because the video has some edits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> edited to make you look bad. Ah. You know, it's like, how is it possible that we've re we're living in the most informed timeline? I have information to all of planet Earth's knowledge. I've got three cell phones and two laptops in front of me. I can get all of human made knowledge in a second, in an instant. We're living in the most informed time. We're also living in the dumbest time. Dare to be stupid. <laughs> it's, 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 it, I, it, you know, we thought the we thought giving everybody access to information would make people smarter. As it turns out, it hasn't. It's exposed the uh, willful ignorance and uh, idiocy uh, throughout the planet. Unfortunately. Uh, I thought we were a smarter species, but we're, we're really not. 
we really aren't. Mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty dumb on the whole. And I say this as somebody who's not that smart. We're not, uh, we're, I don't know how we're still alive, actually. <laughs> when you consider, my goodness, if, if somebody the other day, I, I said diversity is their strength. They said it's a weakness. Look at our country. We have crime and this and that. Look at Japan where they have almost no crime. And somebody pointed out they also have no religion. Japan, Japan has almost zero immigration, right? Because it's a very insular society. But they have no religion. And they have very low crime as a result. So tell me what you think about that. Mm. 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 You want to be a monoculture and still have religion? Well, people are still going to kill in whatever deity they believe in name. Simple as that. Right? Yep. You look at you look at Japan. Why has it got such low crime rate, low murder rate, low gun rate? Well, getting a gun in Japan is more difficult than it is in this country, number one. Number two, uh, they don't really have a gun culture in that country. And they don't have religion. Yeah, it's not a one for one comparison here. No, but yeah. people fail to recognize that. Yeah. So good luck, Mr. King. Yeah. All right. A uh, little bit more economic news for you, because uh, as I was mentioned about the interest rates, there was a little bit of something else that came up. Uh, the Bank of Canada had also released a financial stability report uh, and said, and this is important because the conservatives are trying to make you believe one thing about the economy. The Bank of Canada's latest financial stability report says that on inflation and on the risk of recession, both have diminished in Canada and globally. Well, Speculation about when and how much rates will be cut may cause increased volatility in the market at the moment because there are some red flags associated with mortgages. Those who have already renewed can manage by reducing discretionary spending and increasing savings. Now, the reasons why I say that, people are turning around, oh, all those people that got their mortgage. Yes, but all those people that got the mortgages got their mortgages stress test at about 4 or 5% higher than the interest rate at the time. So, yes, people are not having a good time in the sense that their discretionary spending is now going toward interest payments, but they can still afford the payments for the most part. Uh, credit card debt holders who are not mortgage holders, however, average about 80% of their credit limit, uh, given uh, about 20% interest rates. Financial institutions may have to make some changes in order to help. Uh, we also have to realize in Canada, when they talk about Canada being heavily indebted, uh, for most of us, that are indebted because we have houses, these are, these are secured debts mm -hmm. as well, right? As opposed to this part here, the credit card debt uh, from debt holders who are not mortgage holders and don't have any additional collateral, right? That's different debt than mortgage debt. Financial, uh, right now, when looking at the whole economy, again, the Bank of Canada, and I want to make this clear again, right now, when looking at the whole economy, there is no reason for panic no. There are a few areas where we need to be vigilant. This is, of course, according to Mustafa Askaria, the chief economist at the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy. There is no reason to panic. Kevin Page, the other day, said, there is no crisis. Mustafa Askari, there is no reason to panic. Our economy is being well run, regardless of what conservatives mm -hmm. choose to say. I do have a, a screen sh a, a thing I want to share with you. I just sent it to you in the DMs, yep. but I want to share this because I think it's uh, somebody uh, earlier pointed out, uh, or who was it who said the money? Oh, yeah, from Carol. Yes. Carol, uh, the money being transferred by baby boomers in the next few years. Wow, let's just uh, remember when we cried as kids and our parents said, I'll give you something to cry about. We thought they were going to hit us, but instead they destroyed the housing market, quadrupled college tuition, and melted the ice caps. <laughs> There's a word for that. We call it over-extraction. <laughs> I saw that on the weekend and I laughed hysterically. 
because I know some boomers who would actually completely 100% agree with that statement. I, and I've met a few of them who said, oh yeah, we screwed your generation completely. They've said it point blank. Yep. Oh yeah, we did it. We were yep. greedy and we got everything for nothing and we left nothing for those coming behind us. And I've heard a number of boomers say this and I was shocked the first time I heard it, but I've heard a few since say, oh yeah, yeah, we created this problem. Oh yeah, we took we it did all. It. We took it all. And we elected a president under the guidance of Milton Friedman, who believed the shareholder holds all the power and that the workers are meaningless. And the trickle-down economy started in 1980. Basically, most of the the ground we had made up prior to that point had been ripped out from underneath us. Yeah. Unions started disintegrating left, right, and center in the U.S. In 1980, somebody earning minimum wage could A, save enough money for a down payment for a house, and B, get a mortgage. Yes, the interest rates were high, but it was doable. And the house was also not, you know, a hundred times your earnings. Now, the average home in Ottawa, I think, is somewhere close to a million. So unless you have generational wealth or parents who can bequeath a lot of money or they sell their house and go into a retirement home and give you the profits from their home so you can put a down payment to purchase something. Most people I know are, it's just simply, it's an impossibility now. If you didn't buy 10 or 15 years ago, chances of buying today uh, without generational wealth or a down payment or a gift, it ain't happening. That's in the cities. Now you can get into smaller towns where that's a different story, into rural settings, non-urban areas. That's a different story. But in, in larger population centers across the country, and look at, look at what it's done to the real estate market in Nova Scotia, where all kinds of people have moved into the Halifax area in the last few years. I mean, Nova Scotia is over a million people, and I think half a million are in Halifax alone. Try and buy a house, and, and I'm sure uh, Saucy Seawitch, Rhiannon, can, can let us know what, what it's done to real estate in her neighborhood, uh, which is not exactly a walking distance to Halifax, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? Right. It's a small community, and, and housing prices have gone insane. And, you know, do I have a solution for it? Yeah. Government needs to build more housing and get people into them. Uh, so does industry. At a, at a geared to income level, though, right? Yes. Yep, because that 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 market, that whole uh, serving serving that whole market has been wiped out over the last thirty or so, thirty or so years. Oh yes, yeah. Look at that Burlington. Nothing under one point two million for detached. Jeez, what is? Let me just see the average Ottawa home price. Home price right now is. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, main housing stats for Ottawa, May 1st, 2024. The average price for a home in Ottawa, including, including residential homes and condos, is now $708,848, an increase of over of 1.8% over April 2023. So, I mean, the, the pricing today is sort of, I wouldn't say stalled, but in a year, it's only gone up 1.8%. Well, that, that's good, but still... 20% of $700,000. <laughs> you, you do realize not that many years ago, that was a home. The down yep. payment was a house. 30 yep. years ago, that was a house. Yep. And I'm talking like a two-story front yard, backyard, garage, two-car garage in Orleans. That was the price of a home 30 years ago. Now, you weren't serviced well by transit or anything like that. You absolutely had to have a car. But that was the price of a home in Blackburn Hamlet, in Barhaven, in Orleans. These are all suburban areas that are now within the city of Ottawa. That was the price of a home 30 years ago. It was about 150000 You could get a house. And an expensive house at the time was two fifty, But now they start at seven hundred and eight. There are condos in my neighborhood that are millions. Steps from where I'm sitting right now. Yep. But I'm also in the poorest uh, uh, ward in the city, where the vast majority of, of people who live in Centertown are poor and working class. 
right. but it's a city. So there's wealth right next door because people want to be downtown. They want to be close to all the action. They want to be able to walk to work, and walk to their groceries, be living in a 15 minute city. Right. So there's going to be wealth here too. But this right. was traditionally one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. And Mechanicsville once was, but that ain't the same anymore. That's been completely gentrified. Yes, it has. The Hintonburg Westboro area, it's completely gentrified. Now you can buy a shack there for $1.6 million. You're going to knock it down and build something new. And I mean literally a shack. Not a strawberry box. An actual shack. <laughs> like a shed. If the shed is on a big enough piece of property that can be divided, if there's a home on it, there's a big enough piece. Yeah. Buy that for $1.2 million and put up a new house. Thanks, boomers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's really funny because this is something I've been saying since I was a teenager. I noticed this when I was a teenager. Yeah, I said it's like you know, you know that that joke, right? It's like you know, it's like, mom, you better be nice to me because I get to choose the home you go to, right? And it's sort of it's just like, and I always said, you know, it's like. Everybody's saying, you know, you got to respect your elders. And I figure it's like, you know, when I'm 40 or 50, we're going to end up with a generation of people that are going to like say, you know what? All that money that we put into seniors programs first, screw that. We're taking that. And we're putting it towards ourselves. You guys got enough already. Because I can see that movement, right? Oh, yeah. PP is already doing it right now. Like this one he's talking about all the time. Like, you know, this intergenerational, uh, you know, betrayal or something of like that you know it's like because we're we've been dividing people on sex and you know race and ethnicity and religion and sexual orientation and gender identity and whatnot like this now you know why not add in some intergenerational culture war as well For yeah everybody under 40 here's the people you need to hate they took it all <laughs> Was just uh... so, so did I at PNC by I, I used to work on Parkdale Avenue at Wacked Radio, selling audio and video equipment. Back in wacked do, wacked do, wacked do. Back in nineteen ninety. Back in nineteen ninety, and then what you're saying is the absolute truth. It's the absolute truth. And uh, what PNC is saying, because we have listeners who didn't see the comment. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yes. tired. It's uh, it says I worked in Mechanicsville when there were sex workers at 9 a.m. checking their cleavage in the IBEW windows. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, their union office is, is in Mechanicsville. There Mechanicsville, I mean, the, the houses are built. It's it's like there's similar neighborhoods. Uh, I remember when we were when we last time we were in Kingston last summer with you, and we were walking back to your place from the grocery store. We walked through some neighborhoods where the houses are very close and the streets are all that's Mechanicsville is almost identical to that. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the houses are very, they're big houses, but they're built very close to one another, tiny yards. Um, some of them have big backyards, not, you know, most of the front yards, they're built right on the street, right? So they could maximize the amount of home they built at the time. But yeah, it's, uh, those houses are, there's very few of them that are, are, you know, from, from that time. And Vanier is also undergoing that. And Vanier has been undergoing that Renaissance for the last, I'd say 20 plus years. Yes. You see the, yeah. the new communities they've built, the new residential towers and condos. They're building apartment towers now. And some people are going in buying up older homes and either gutting them and redoing them or tearing them down. In many cases, they're just doing a complete reno of existing homes because, as the saying goes, it still has good bones. And they're able to pick them up. Well, when my buddy bought his house oh, 12, 14 years ago, mm -hmm. he bought it from a guy who did a full reno and then his wife left him. And he just said, I can't live here and, and had to get out. Okay. So he sold the house way under market value in that neighborhood at the time. And my buddy bought it for a song and it was totally renovated. And the guy did a really good job on the rentals from top to bottom. It's a beautiful home. Uh, the, the, the only thing that wasn't done was the back deck needed to rebuild. And there was a shed that needed to come out of the backyard. So my buddy had to do that. But he's like, all the amount of money I saved by buying in this neighborhood. And I go, and you bought it in this neighborhood at the right time because many people that live in Vanier still, you know, there is a dividing line between New Edinburgh and Vanier. Yeah. Right? Yes. I used to live in New Edinburgh. So yeah. 
Yeah, if you're on one side of Beechwood and you're on the, if you're on the other side of Beechwood. Exactly. Right. So the south side of Beechwood is Vanier, but people who live in that area now are saying, no, this is New Edinburgh because it's been gentrified to a very yes. large degree. But what yes. people need to need to understand that Vanier, much like Mechanicsville, had generational uh, home ownership. So it was like the family built it a hundred years ago or more, and and their children took it over, and their children took it over, and so on and so forth. So when I lived in Vanier, uh, I never felt like I lived in a safer area, and I mean that because all the yeah. people looked out for everybody. Yeah. Everybody looked out for everybody else, and there's people. I felt the same way about Lower Town. Yeah. People say, "Oh, I don't want to walk there at night." It's like you're. This is this is the safest part of the safest. city at night. It's like don't don't go by what people look like. Yeah, go about how people treat each other. And they and everybody looks out for everybody in those neighborhoods. Yep, indeed. All right, we're getting close to the end here because we've been going on for a while. But uh, since we've uh, got you, we have a couple of little bit tidbits for you. Not much development, but uh, little things that uh, you should know. Uh, one, it seems that uh, Justin Bieber is about to have a Tim Bieber of his own. He and his wife Haley have announced that they are expecting oh. and that she is at least six months along. I, I'm like, but he already had Tim Bieber. Oh. oh. Yes, a Tim Bieber of his very own. <laughs> uh, Immigration Minister Mark Miller uh, kicks off Citizenship Week. So happy Citizenship Week, everyone, uh, in Surrey, B.C., where uh, he'll welcome 40 of Canada's newest citizens at a mid-morning ceremony. Uh, Defense Minister Bill Blair today will uh, begin a two-day visit to Washington, D.C. to have a tete-a-tete -tete with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon, where he'll promote Canada's newly updated defense policy, as well as his government's NORAD's modernization plan, and more generally, the Canada-U.S. defense relationship. Uh, later uh, this afternoon, he'll go to the Canadian Embassy in the United States for a live stream conversation with Atlantic Council Senior Fellow Ian Brzezinski that, according to the program, quote, will focus on the updated defense policy, explore U.S.-Canadian bilateral relations, and address Canada's role in transatlantic security, including, quote, the steps Canada and its allies are taking to ensure long-term stability and security of North America and the Euro-Atlantic community, including continued support for Ukraine. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in uh, defense issues, uh, that will start around 2 p.m. Eastern time, and it'll probably be available on CPAC, I would assume, or something like that, so that you can check it out. Um, we heard uh, before going into the weekend uh, that Baron Trump, uh, Donald's uh, youngest son, who uh, we weren't talking much about because we leave the kids out of politics unless they join, uh, had been tapped to be a delegate for the state of Florida in the upcoming uh, federal election, which caused a lot of people to go, uh, and uh, Melania is okay with that. Uh, well, uh, we found out uh, that she wasn't. Quote, Former First Lady Melania Trump's office confirmed the news. While Barron is honored to have been chosen as a delegate by the Florida Republican Party, he regretfully declines to participate due to prior commitments. Like being a kid. Hey, was he 17 <laughs> or 18? Is he 18 yet? He's 18. Yeah. And... Last but not least, the International Olympic Committee has unveiled its largest refugee team yet. 36 athletes from 11 nations will be, will be representing the world's displaced populations, including a judoka from Afghanistan who is training in Toronto. The Rio Olympics in 2016 was the first time displaced athletes were allowed to compete under the Olympic banner. And if we're talking sports, kids and cubs, I believe it's today or tomorrow, uh, the National Swimming Trials. Uh, start. So if you uh, want to watch those, the CBC Sports Player will have uh, the broadcasts live and the replay. Devin Haru, our friend, uh, will be there. He also got, uh, once again, the marquee assignments of track and field and uh, swimming at the Olympics. And it awesome. seems that uh, Canada may be, uh, is could easily be winning uh, 12 to 15 of its medals from those two events alone. So we're going to be getting a chance to see a lot of Devon doing uh, what he does best. And uh, we will be all the better for it. Also, newsflash, I've been speaking to him. And uh, the week of the 21st, either the Monday or the Friday, we haven't confirmed yet. Uh, but he will be with us so that Once we can again. talk sports and all that good stuff, and yay, yay, Team Canada, and have a, a lighter episode. So uh, please, kids and cubs, tune in uh, next week. 
Mr. Grizzly, do we have well, a show? Tune in every day, preferably. Oh, if you can. Well, yes, absolutely. But I mean, <laughs> let, 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 let's let's just say that uh, yeah, we we are both absolutely wonderfully good looking chaps. But uh, it, it gets better when Devin arrives. Yeah, he's a charming fellow. We like. Yes, him. yes. Just, the, sex, the sex appeal of the show kind of goes up. <laughs> all right kids and cubs uh, we hope that you loved uh, this episode of the daily beaver morning show because we love making this to you remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless and you have the mouths from which we want the word to come so please please tell your peeps and poops all about us and make sure to check out the tneb sorry the tneb merch store by scanning that qr code that's right under my chin that mr grizzly has just put up there anything uh pretty much anything on the planet on which you can stick a logo we got so <laughs> you need keychains you need underwear you need a water bottle you need stickers you need t-shirts we got them for you so uh a carpet yeah. would you like a carpet <laughs> would you like a carpet oh no i've got one out there seriously so is it eager for carpet now yeah yeah oh my word Okay. Well, there you go, kids. <laughs> um, if you would uh, like to make sure that you don't miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. If you scan the QR code that I'm sure Mr. Grizzly will now make appear under my chin, that will bring you to our pod page site. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you scan that and click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. Yes, Kit Cassie, there is uh, an inherent um, redundancy by saying beaver rug. <laughs> Goodbye, mine beaver hair. I got it everywhere. I have to use some nair, mine beaver hair. <laughs> there you can oh, see it right there. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, there's the carpet. A nice round throw. Ah, oh, gee. By the way, I, I stole a goodbye by being beaver hair from a group called the Kinsey Six. Kinsey K I K I N S E Y Six S I C K S. Uh, if you like parody uh, music and comedy, uh, I suggest you go take a listen to them. They're a lot of fun. Uh, if you would like to support us, you can do that by going to the True North Eager Beaver Media YouTube page and. Uh, Having fun with our buttons. Come on and click on all our buttons, babe. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, share, and subscribe. Make like the pussycat dolls. And click, click, click. <laughs> Push all our buttons. We like that. And, uh, of course, make like Kit Elaine. And click them. And if you would like to help us in other ways, you can go to our coffee page. The QR code by Mr. Grizzly's Dome right there will bring you right there. Or if you use those lovely digits on those lovely hands or your voice prompt to go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. Well, there you will find the Emergency Hydration Fund, our fancy name for our tip jar, where if you happen to have a little bit of money, uh, you know, just weighing you down. Sometimes you just, sometimes you need to be a little lighter and you just got to get rid of some bills or some coinage. So we like to help. So if you just go to our tip jar and leave a little in there that helps us produce this show and uh well you will enter you will earn our eternal gratitude and your sex appeal will go up 28.3 percent it's nice. science nice just so you know tipping is very Everybody sexy use a little bit more of that right tipping Almost is like sexy true. just saying all, right. Yeah. all right from the beaver lodge this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there kids so please be kind to you and gentle with yourself mr grizzly some words of wisdom please uh you know i'm, I'm kind of uh Hmm. Bereft of wisdom? No, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out a way to word this, and I might just save it for, yeah, you know what? I, I'm going to save it for the ASMR tonight because I do have a, some stuff I need to talk about, uh, some, some emotions and feelings that I'm going through, and how not giving in to them is self-preservation. So I'll leave it at that for now, but I will have an ASMR at 9 p.m. I will go into detail about what I'm currently feeling and the emotions I'm feeling and the fight or flight response and how I'm not answering either one of those calls because quite frankly I don't want to you know so yeah 
that's my words of wisdom. Uh, join us tonight on my ASMR. I'll put the code up here for you to find it. Mm -hmm. And around what time is that, Mr. Grizzly? 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Eastern time, kids. Yeah. Eastern Standard, or Eastern Daylight Time, I guess. Eastern Daylight Time, yes. 9 p.m. for my uh, uh, ASMR mental health chat every Monday at 9 p.m. Every Monday when I can do it. Sometimes I'm not emotionally there to do it or just physically exhausted. But uh, I am going to talk tonight because i got a couple of things I want to. I want to discuss, and I think it might be helpful for somebody who might be feeling the same way. Okay. Ms. Shadika goes, I think that will be a good show for Jazzy to watch, Paul. All right. And uh, please give Jazzy, Raid, and Matea our best, Ms. Shadika. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits, and we'll have a fun little Easter egg for you. Okay, sir. Let me just uh, find them here because it's... You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients Fill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, Kit Scubs. At the, the beginning of the show, I mentioned uh, something about Mother's Day, so we have a little something for you. But before we do it, um, you know, when I say uh, thanks to all the mothers, though, and uh, the people that have been motherly and mothering, uh, that includes some of you here uh, in the chat kits, uh, since we, uh, you know, we're only four years old. We're actually three years old fully. We're starting our fourth year. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of you that have done a lot for us. And uh, the... I would say uh, great uh, from what we can tell based on data and what we can tell by tips coming in. Um, we have an incredible uh, amount of support. Even we'd say probably more than half our support uh, comes from women and I would assume mothers. Uh, so uh, thank you very, very much for uh, being good to us, uh, taking us on, including us into your families. All right. You'll listen. Oh no. Up, kids, let me drop a little wisdom. Mother's Day gifts are nice, but let's talk about the system. You hand me a card that says, Mum, you're the best. But brunch once a year, it ain't passing the test. You think I'm a mosa, what, and a rosa enough? You forget all the times that were so, so tough. Sleepless nights, diapers changed with finesse. Don't act like brunch just erases that stress. I taught you to walk to talk and to read gave you all the tools you need to plant every seed mother's day huh yeah i get to sleep in but just remember brunch don't make us even brunch don't make us even make us even brunch don't make us even make us even huh every day should be mother's day <laughs> I. That's bet, and I'm in love. <laughs> Mr. Christling, I think I'm in love. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> I love a saucy granny. 